Um, so recommendation that council move out of in camera at uh, five o'clock. Councilor Evans, Councilor Mollis, all in favor of in camera into the five minute pilot break and uh, we'll get back into the regular time. But there's probably food there, I would think. Eh? I think I've seen Sarah bring some sandwiches and an exclamation point. Who's that from? I can imagine it. You might do what you're doing in the forest.
five. Moved by Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Ferries. All in favor? Carried. 425 Main Street, temporary community showcase. Recommendation that the District of Sycamore Council resolves to temporarily suspend enforcement of its sign button hmm. number 814 20. 11 until August 31st, 2022, to allow for temporary signage at 425 Main Street from valid business license form holders, provided that the signage received approval from the development service manager designate. Need a mover on this, Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Bushel. All right, Daryl, you want to give us a report? Uh, this one should be there. If that's me, it's saying that I'm going to stop others. Sarah. Yeah. You can give us a report. <clears throat> Just give me a moment here, everyone. I'm trying to get out of the uh, screen so that I can actually advance the slides. Take the chair for a minute. I got the first. Okay. I'm allowed here. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, Sarah, you have the floor. <laughs> So what this is about is uh, an effort to improve the appearance of our housing development site for the summer. Uh, you may have already noticed that we've got a little seating area that Public Works has put in right at the frontage on Main Street, as well as a pilot project for a community garden. Uh, in addition to that, we were looking to fill some of the space with a temporary community showcase which would consist of a static display, if council wishes, uh, of all that Sycamuse has to offer this summer. So what it would come down to is opening it up to business license holders in good standing and allowing them to post some small temporary signage that fits within this theme of places to go, things to see, and what's happening. So the reason why this needs to come to council is because our sign bylaw, while it does delegate the operations manager to approve temporary signage, this type of temporary signage doesn't fall within that category because it's for businesses as opposed to a special event or a community issue. So the proposal is that uh, council could uh, choose not to enforce the sign bylaw for 425 Main Street for the summer, uh, and that valid business license holders could post signage there subject to approval of the development service manager or designate. Got here up on the screen uh, a site plan to give you an idea of where that is. So the blue bubble, it would be the showcase area. You can see where the benches and the garden are. Main Street would be on the top of the screen. And this was the recommendation. Thank you for your presentation. Any comments? Councillor Mamas? Mr. Chair. <clears throat> grab a little bit. So are you saying that grab a grab us wants to put a sign over mm -hmm. there that uh, the smokehouse wants to put a sign over there. The cannabis shop over here wants to put a sign over there. How are you going to orientate them or line them up? Like, wow, how is that circle going to work over there? Like, first off, that ground, because I've been over there dropping off some plants, is not exactly flat. So, well, how much money we got to spend so you can walk around in the sides and actually look at them? 
who's going to put the sides there? Yeah, through the chair, I, I think leveling we could probably do in house in terms of the layout. I'm not. I'm not sure what's provided. So in terms of layout, there is an existing uh, access there. Uh, that, which would be this loop here. The sort of amended benches are here now, so it would come through there, which is basically established at this point. Public Works has done a lot of work there. And then sides would be oriented to face on that access, driveway access. And come around to about where the shade tends is for the community garden. Even far back into the site, it would stay further forward from the property so that it's more visible in the street. Councillor Evans and Councillor Wallace. Yeah, I, I I think it's a great idea. I, I'm in favor of it because anything that's going to be up there has got to be passed through our staff, and they'll make sure that it's high quality and looks great. I think it's a great idea. Councillor Mullins. Like I said, I, I'm still confused about who's going to put their sign over there because if you're going to have a high visibility quality sign, they're expensive. If you're just talking about putting it up for the summer. And is the suggestion that you're going to drive it off the road and then drive out to look at these sides, or are you going to walk it off the road to look at these sides? Like a few things missing in this, what we're doing. Like having some business have sides there is one thing, but if you're going to say temporary use, what is it? Somebody gets a piece of paint and stuff on top of it. Like, there's not a lot of clarity. Sorry. Councilor Bushell. Yeah, through the chair, sir, or maybe Daryl, the question for Daryl. <clears throat> um, have you had a lot of demand for this? Like we said, it's only temporary. I didn't I didn't know if you had a lot of demand for this. And uh, I know you guys got your plate full in the group. And uh, just I didn't we didn't want to load you up. Through the chair, I I haven't had any demand for this. I, I wasn't I wasn't sure about uh, this. This is the first time I've seen this plan myself. So. <laughs> I mean, we could help out any way. Let's see if we could level and stuff. So, I'd like to recognize myself. Oh, hi. No. No. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of not in favor of this because I, uh, I think it looks nice the way it is. Uh, staff has done a great job of mowing the back half there, so it's the weeds aren't coming in, and and there's the staff has got the benches there with the flower pots. Um, I've, I've noticed lots of people stopping and sitting there. Um, I think the view is just having a nice manicured lot there, and and the staff has done a great job of maintaining the back half and and keeping it mowed, <clears throat> and and the pop up uh, garden with the shade tent there and the water tap. I think the ambiance is is nice the way it is. I think if you add signs to it, it's in in my opinion, it's it's sign pollution. Uh, we we've had members from our business community ask to put up signs at the dog park, and we've said no. Um, I I, I think it doesn't set a very good precedent, and uh, I think it's nice. I think staff have done a nice job, and it's nice the way it is. I you know, and if it's just going to be from now until the end of August. And you can have those signs that flap in the wind or, or you could have a sandwich sign or a, a self-supporting sign. So there could be a whole mix of signs. Uh, you know, how many signs fit in there properly? At what point do we say to one business owner that, sorry, um, you're too late. There's already too many signs, so we're not accepting any more signs in there. Um, I... If it's not driven by the demand, Daryl says he hasn't had any. I don't know if we've had any requests from front desk or anything. If if it's not driven by demand, and I, I think it's fine. It is. I think it looks nice right now. Uh, and that's all I got to say. <laughs> well, I got to talk. I got to so <laughs> yeah. uh, Thanks to the chair. Um, Generally opposed to the idea, but um, being that the time of the year, uh, July, businesses are inclined to get in on this. They might be able to to make make the, the sign that could be best, and just be inclined to use what they have, which could be it, it could lead to a lot of trouble. And 
uh, the, we have the planning department trying to decide what's actually permissible or not if people are trying to put signs that they might have used in years past out there because they're not able to get one made in time for the summer. Go ahead, Sarah. Through the chair, I do wonder if council would be supportive of the development corporation and chamber of commerce putting up uh, like some tourism signage. Uh, Carly has been looking for a place to put up something that has their uh, their brochure, all their events that are happening around sick and this summer, and there's some mapping showing where different locations are. Uh, they they would be interested in putting up something like that. Councilor Malmas. Sorry, through the chair, why didn't you just say that at the beginning? <laughs> like I thought to you and everybody, I asked who's going to put the sign up. That was, that's fine. If it's, if it's, we, we own the Economic Development Corporation, it's ours. So if they want to put a sign up there on our property while they're waiting for the development to happen, if it does happen, then I don't see an issue with that. Chamber, again, is a subsidized study of the district. So I don't see an issue with that, but to go to the businesses as Ryan said, they wouldn't have time to do it. If it's promoting our events and it's giving you a bath of the community, then yeah, that's good. I agree. Uh, I'm a full support of the Development Corporation or the Chamber of Commerce for sure putting signs up there. I just find it being temporary. Um, you know, I just this late in the season, it's tough for, you know, who's going to sell them, who's going to, who's going to, so times are expensive and uh, they got to look good or they don't, they don't, they'll, you know, deteriorate and, and the sign of the property look, it'll look terrible before you know it. We have control of the system of commerce or development corporation. Malcolm? Yeah, I agree. Uh, Dev Corp for sure, Chamber of Commerce. It doesn't set a precedent that way. It's our property. The F Corp works for us collectively as council. So I don't see an issue with that at all. Um, but individual businesses, yeah, it's just a, it would be an administrative nightmare, I think. And, and I don't think it would look very pretty either. But if, if the Def Corp want to put a kiosk up or something like that, you know, and it's approved through the, through the planning staff, I don't think it even needs to come back to council. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so that's the question. Do you do we need a resolution to basically say that that we can have signs put up by the ex and by the chamber? Those are the only two. I don't know if we even need a recommendation for that. So, so then I would not go to pay with that. All right, we have a resolution on the table right now and um uh, I've got a number and a seconder on this, um, so I could call the question. I think, I'm sorry, I just sent um, up this resolution right there. To temporarily suspend our signed bylaw to have businesses on the Main Street property to put up temporary signs permitted by the development services movement. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for catching me up yeah. on that. Okay, um, I have to agree with the other councillors. I think it's too late. Um, maybe a, a bigger plan for next year. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, ECDEV, I support. Chamber of Commerce Supporting Visitor Information Center, I support. Um, but all businesses right now at this point in time, <clears throat> not in favor. Yeah, we'd have to defort, defeat this motion that's yeah. presented. All right, then I'll call the question on the motion. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, it's defeated. But could I can I put a motion forward on this agenda, Tom? Bob was in favor. Yeah, notice. Could I put a motion forward on this yeah, topic? Yeah. That that we do allow a variance to the sign our, our sign with the proper word variance to our uh, sign bylaw number 814, 2011 until August the 31st to allow Def Corp and Chamber to place sign as approved by planning department. Okay. Can you read that? Um, <clears throat> basically the same motion except for valid business owners. We're gonna say the Def Corp yeah. and uh, 
Chamber. Yeah, switch out valid business license folders yeah. to DevCorp and uh, Chamber. Okay, I need a seconder. Commissions. Councilor Anderson. Moved by Councilor McCabe. Any other comments or questions on this? Councilor Anderson. Supporting Visitor Information Center, because that's going to cover all the businesses. Sure. Okay. All right. I call a question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Mm. All right. Uh, temporary use permit. As a late item recommendation of council direct staff to prepare amendment to the official community plan to designate the town center as a temporary use permit area for council's consideration at the July 27th, 2022 regular council meeting of council. I need a mover on this. Councilor McKee or Councilor Malmas, seconded by sure. Councilor Anderson. Any comments or questions on this? Who's like to start from Sarah? We just get a bit of update, just a... Oh, you want to share your screen? Okay. Stop sharing. Okay, <clears throat> so currently our official community plan designates several areas where uh, council can consider the issuance of the uh, sorry temporary uh, use permits, which allows for uses to be trialed or uses that currently allow for zoning amendment. So those areas of Sycamore currently include highway commercial, marine, residential, and industrial. So it doesn't include the town center currently. Uh, so recently, in the past couple of years since I've been here, it's come up a few times where it would be helpful if the district was able to contemplate issuing temporary use permits within the town center to help trial new uses, see how they work, or uh, to support phase development uh, proposals. So because this has come up because of some recent applications that the district has received, uh, staff have made the following recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Comments or questions? Councilor <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, I'm just going to speak very frankly on this one. And uh, I was at a planning committee meeting and, and Councilor Malmas chaired and one of the agenda topics was a, a temporary use for uh, town center. I felt Councillor Momus was in, in, in conflict because the applicant was uh, a friend. I, I, I mentioned that to Councillor Momus, I mentioned it to my fellow councillors. I think everyone except, I don't think I mentioned Councillor Ryan. And I mentioned it to Mary. So, I, and so we have an app, we had we have an owner that owns most of the town center applying for a temporary use permit through the planning committee. The planning committee, the uh, the chair didn't excuse himself because he felt he wasn't in conflict, and went to the extent of saying, "Well, why don't you include the 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 old uh, maintenance yard too in your application and let's make it all temporary use and that I that the chair supported it 100 percent and that it was quote unquote fantastic um but yet staff said well that's all we have in front of us is, is a plan of all the property the uh, the owner owns highlighted in yellow no no detail about and the temporary use permit was for RVs and parking um, and it was referred back to um, staff to talk to the owner about you need way more detail in here uh, than that to get a temporary use permit. Uh, the planning committee didn't mention that, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't match your OCP and short of the commercial use, which uh, the owner has one section of land designated highway commercial. It's already designated for that use. Uh, the planning community didn't mention that the rest of it is is 
doesn't comply with the OSFP and you can't even get a temporary use permit because it's in the town center and, and that's not covered by any current bylaws. So I feel that this is a, a backdoor approach to getting the town center approved for temporary use permits so the landowner can then come back and say, yes, I'd like a temporary use permit for parking and RVs like he has already asked the planning committee. So I think there's kind of an old boys network thing going on here, in my opinion. And uh, I, I think um, uh, I think if we allow this, what we're going to allow is for six years. I mean, the cheapest way to make money is is to put in an RV lot. It's cheaper than a house subdivision or anything, and it generates uh, some good revenue. So, if we allow a temporary use in town center uh, by passing this, we're, we're saying yes to six years of RV lots on, on, on town center instead of landowners developing it like we're asking for in our OCP and the current bylaws for density and commercial. Because if the landowner generates revenue being an RV lot, there's no real incentive to develop it to uh, its, its original intent for a density and commercial use. So I think it's counterproductive to say yes to allowing temporary use permits in town center because it doesn't incentivize landowners to to develop the property properly and it does allow them to come in the back door and, and use it for unintended use for up to six years so just to comment on your comments mm -hmm. about uh i think that maybe this is a sidetrack and um how this surfaced was because of the new owners of the pair, the, um, the, paradise, the, hotel. the paradise hotel. And, uh, and in order for them, and they came and did a presentation to council to, or to the uh, planning committee meeting in order to uh, maybe have some RVs on their property and uh, also a laundromat and so forth. And so that's why when they, applied for the temporary use permit then the OCP became onerous and and the and the uh, and the contents of the OCP was restricting them from having a temporary use permit on something that the planning committee agreed upon and I think council actually thought that might be not a bad idea in order to support the downtown core and the businesses when it comes to some RVs mm -hmm. on uh, the paradise so that's where this came up and I had a conversation with Sarah and I had a conversation with Jen and, and so that became owners because of the wording within the OCP. And so I, I understand where you're coming from, but um, um, that's the restriction. Um, I think, okay, Gord, you, your comments and then counter moments. To the chair, yeah, I, you know, I mean, we have them on every other, uh, zone in our community other than the downtown core, we still have the right to cap it, to not to not uh, uh, take any um, temporary use permits. I know that Cynthia, we've been issuing Cynthia one for quite a few quite a few years, and she since sold that motel to the new owners who went for a use permit. We still have control, and we can deny uh, any any on a on an individual basis. And um, you know, it, it does it does hamstring us a little bit um, if we don't have the downtown core. That's my opinion. <clears throat> Jeff? Uh, through the chair, I'd, I'd be very truthful about what you accused me of, Councillor McKay. I don't have a friendship with uh, anybody when it comes to district business. So the reason that I suggested to our boy to come in here for temporary use permit is because he has a sign right across the road that says camping. And I said, it's allowed on the big piece of property that he has, and it's allowed parking on the seven acres that he had because it's sold highway commercial. So it's allowable use within that property. So when I suggested to him that he might as well make all of his property, he didn't want to make the blue building anything to do with that. He said, because he doesn't have access between the two properties because he doesn't own the one in the middle. So he suggested the other side. 
If you read point 13 of our OCP, which the chair of that is in the audience, the district will consider establishment of a waterfront and town center parking areas designation within designated areas the district may establish a mechanism to collect funds and develop. We have not in the whole time that we've been here, eight years since we've actually created, this is the first document that we actually did. We still don't have any parking at all. Unless we want to turn 200 Main Street into a parking lot, which might make some people happy. But we desperately need parking for the downtown core. So, and as the mayor said, this did not come because of that. It came because of something else. So you should find out everything before you start accusing me of having a friendship that's involved in doing something in the history. I think great offense. All right. Anderson. I'm not a big fan of temporary use permits. I don't. They just never seem to go away. Um, I am not in favor of making downtown a temporary use permit. If Paradise would like um, to do some camping, which is one-offs, which we have done before, I'd like to see us keep that um, bylaw in place, but turning downtown into temporary use permit areas and allowable, I'm not in favor of. Councilor Malmas, to the chair. Um, so, you know, what's happened on Main Street in Phoenix since you've been elected? The only development, the only thing that's happened is what the district's done. The lots across the streets, other than the dental office, as we've had a couple of businesses run up, but there is no zero new construction, not a lot So, People that are paying the property tax in here, I think, should be entitled to have a source of some sort of revenue to cover off the tax bill, because that land over there is worth a fortune. I think that the Paradise Hotel is in the twenty-one or twenty-two thousand dollars a year in property tax. So, you know, if you could find an alternative way to actually make money on your property, we've used properties in town where we used to have our events downtown that block off Main Street. So there's been landowners that have allowed us to use the guy who has the property between <clears throat> uh, smokehouses and Mike Oldie's place. We put bleachers up on there. We did this. So, you know, I think it's a way to give something back to those people and say, you don't know who's going to show up and do what. They still have to, if I'm reading this right, if we allow it as a temporary use, it's not just a given that they get a temporary use permit. They still have to go through the process. It just makes it a little simpler. That's all it does. They still have to come in here, go through the process. In the presentation, the temporary use permit was temporary use, and uh, their presentation was uh, their pretty much short-term vision, some maybe long-term vision. They wanted to find a, an opportunity to get some revenue off of their property at this particular stage with the intentions of they would like to build a hotel uh, complex on that in three to four years, but for the interim, they would like to see some revenue sources. And I think, uh, and the temporary use permit was was uh, brought forward, but then the OCP became uh, a problem when I talked to Sarah about this. So that's the idea of a temporary use permit. And then so they can get some alternative revenue maybe for the next two or three years off of that particular property. I don't see a problem with it because I think, you know, uh, I also see where a few uh, RVs on Main Street probably would be able to assist maybe some of the downtown um, businesses and um, a little bit more traffic on Main Street certainly wouldn't hurt. And we, Councilor McKay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it would just de-incentivize uh, landowners to to develop because if they have a revenue stream that's the cheapest source, an RV that's self-contained, not even any sewer water, just a self-contained RV lot, maybe with some power, um, why would they? They're making money and then our town is not developing. Uh, so if, if we keep it um, without a temporary use permit in the downtown core, then anybody who's buying land or own lands there knows that they're not gonna get a temporary use permit. So they should focus on development. 
uh, to, to recover money from their taxes, that they can't just sit on it without doing anything because we want to see our town grow. We, we want to see the, the town, town, down core grow. And it's not going to grow if you, if you allow folks uh, a six year temporary use permit. Um, yes, they need to recover money from their property. That encourages them to come up with a business plan that's viable to, to do a development that matches the OCP. I mean, if we allow this, we might as well uh, uh, forget about our OCP. I mean, a temporary use permit is, is uh, from what some, some of the uses I've seen and are, are just a backhouse door to uh, bypass all our bylaws and zoning and just to create some, um, some cheap revenue without a lot of outlay of cash. And, and, it, and it just doesn't encourage landowners to develop like, we're, like we want to see some density commercial development in our downtown center. If, if we allow temporary use permits, we're not going to see development. Why would you? I wouldn't. Bush. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm Malcolm. I hear you. And I, and, but I, you gotta, you got to look at it from the developer side. You know, uh, the cost of uh, owning a piece of property, commercial piece of property, is very, very expensive. And you do have to make it pay. You have to make it pay. The buck stops here. We can we can turn down any temporary use permit we want. Council can do that. And for this gentleman to come into our community, send over a million dollars or a million and a half for his, for his uh, hotel there, and he wants to, you know, phase in a development, whether it be a hotel with a water slide like he's talking, it takes you and you can't do it overnight. And he's just looking for a little way to pay the taxes and another expense of the way. We can say no. If if we don't want a hotel there with a water water park, we could say no right off the hop hop and and he would probably put this place up for sale and move on. But and, and Jeff, I even <clears throat> take offense to your comment that nothing's changed on Main Street. Every building on Main Street has upgraded since we became mm -hmm. council. Upgrade. Every every everyone has upgraded and did some sort of upgrade. So it is changing, but it ain't going to change overnight, and it ain't going to change if you don't work with the businesses because it is tough to make a, make a go. You guys buy a business and try it. It's difficult, it's difficult to make a go paying those huge taxes. Yeah, that's why I support this temporary use permit because I think that um, it's a catalyst to you know development in the future. So. Uh, I, I would like to see them have some sort of revenue off of their property, at, you know, temporary. It's a temporary use permit. I mean, that's the whole idea of temporary use permit, but the OCP doesn't allow it. So, um, I don't know. The OCP is also a living document. Councillor, I think Bob and, Evans, Bob and myself, <laughs> or Colleen, Bob and me. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like the staff to prepare um, and I just Council Bushel said we can say no. I'd like to see what they come up with and uh, um, I'd like to remain open-minded on it a little bit. Councilor McCabe and Councilor Anderson. Yeah, so in our existing temporary use permit, it doesn't talk about RVs. Yes, it does talk about parking, and yes, we do need parking, and yes, I support parking. But even in temporary use permit, it doesn't cover off uh, RV parks or RV pads. Even if it, even if it was, uh, don't know if I'm wrong, I might be wrong. Maybe over to Sarah. Through the chair, I just want to clarify that in in this particular example, um, the councilor McKay raises. That prop, those lands are already in the temporary use permit area, and they're not they're not affected by the fact that the town center is not designated for temporary use permits. I'm sorry. So the Yarmaloy properties are in a temporary use permit area currently. Uh, highway commercial is, but they're not all highway commercial. The ones that are that are coming forward for application, the ones we've received application for. They are. Oh, okay. So just, I just wanted to clarify that for you. Um, and, I, and I would like to add one piece of information about the Paradise proposal. 
the first phase of their project is actually not a hotel. It's a mixed use commercial building that has residential apartments on the top floor. So it would include apartments for their family, but also for either sale or rent. I don't think they're firm on that, but it would include additional housing as well as more commercial space on the bottom floor that wouldn't just be for the hotel, it would be available for other businesses. So correct me if I'm wrong. So we can, uh, right now, as it sits, we don't uh, allow it, but Paradise Motel has come to us before and we've given them a temporary use permit for RVs. So businesses can still come to, without this being changed, businesses can still come to council and ask for a temporary use permit. Not in this area, no. So I, I, I so suspect what you're talking about is in the C1 zone. There is language in there that allows a limited number of our rooms, and there's some restrictions around that on commercial properties. And what these guys are asking for is a lot more than what that allows for. So can I just finish off? Um, so what zone is Paradise Motel in? So they're not in, but they're in city center. Exactly. Or town center. They're in both. It's an overlapping land use designation. Okay. Sorry. Well, maybe we should table this and figure out, get all of our facts straight first. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so just the direction we're looking from council is, do you want us to prepare amendments for council's consideration to allow temporary use permits in the town center? Um, this would be step one before the paradise temporary use permit would even be considered. Um, we can't even get to that step unless council is willing to allow temporary use permits. So if council wants us to dabble into this, that's just what we're looking for today. Do you want us to prepare these amendments? Do you want to dedicate staff time to this to bring it back for you to have a look? Or does council want to, is council's opinion that no, we want to stay consistent with what our OCP says right now and not allow temporary use permits. Um, the merits of what the temporary use permit will still need to come forward. Um, this is just that step one. Jeff and Ryan. Uh, through the chair. So, like, if you look at the map, you can see that all of Finley said on the highway is temporary use. All the pink is temporary use. So, what's not in the temporary use is the gateway and the downtown core. So, it's a, it's all what you're trying to stop is the viewpoint. It's all we allow in most areas. And for these guys to do it, they can't do it because it's not allowed that. So, and I think they're going to do a great development over there. As I said, they came in and made a presentation to the Planning Development Committee, a commercial lower level, accommodations upstairs, which is exactly what we're looking for, rental places. And then at some point, they were going to consider a hotel there, now the hotel that they have there. But that hotel would remain while they built the building in front. They laid it all out, they had it all the map and everything. So, Ryan? Uh, well, I, I don't like that we're talking about a specific application when we're talking about a general idea here. Uh, temporary, I, we've been, we treat our downtown zoning and the OCP as, as pretty sacred around here. And it's the first thing that, that I refer to if an application for a variance or a similar application comes through. And I, I do see this as a workaround to that. And we're trying to form a specific character in our downtown. And I think businesses are are opening and making plans based on their neighbors having that same zoning and, and what we're building towards here. And I haven't gotten a great feeling for temporary use permits in my in my time here. I think they get abused. People get a permit to do something and then they do in-ground works that are like committing to keeping those works. And we don't look very nice if we don't grant another temporary use permit. I just think they take up a lot of time and they generally don't do the neighbors of these properties any good and people don't come here to voice them. I'm pretty sure I'll be opposed. And today I, I'm not, not in favor of, of looking into it. All right. All right, but we do have a recommendation that we've got a mover in a sector on it. We do. Okay. Any other comments? More and then uh, we'll call a question. Yeah, and <clears throat> just like to thank Jennifer for pointing out that we're not, we're not changing the zoning right now. We're just <clears throat> um, asking staff to prepare amendments to the official community plan. To, so it doesn't hurt to look at more information because we're not making a decision. We're just asking for more information. 
but I might vote yes for this, but by me voting yes, it doesn't mean that I'll vote yes down the road after we get additional information, but it doesn't hurt to, I wouldn't mind seeing maps. Like I, I know on Pinlison, there's some properties that are, are commercial, uh, highway commercial, and then the one right next door is, is not, you know, for no rhyme or reason, you know, when you just look at it geographically and location and everything. So I wouldn't mind seeing some maps that say, okay, this is allowed this kind of permit, no temporary use permits here, but you can have one here, but they're both in the same uh, zone. The OCP doesn't allow, but the, the property designated commercial allows it, but it's in the core center. So why is it allowed? Um, more information wouldn't hurt. So I might vote in favor of this just so we have more information in front of me, but it doesn't mean I'll carry on down that road. Okay, thank you. With that, I'm going to call the question on this resolution. It was moved by uh, Councilor Malmus and seconded by Councilor Anderson. Okay. Okay, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Councilor Aries and Councilor Anders opposed. The, the recommendation and the motion has been carried. Mm -hmm. So we'll leave it in the staff's hands. Yes. All right, uh, administration update. Capital projects, Daryl, you wanna give us an update on capital projects? Sure, through the chair, got a, a short update this week. Uh, I think it's, I got a presentation with one slide at the end, so I missed that. Uh, Solska Bridge, we're, uh, we're continuing to get uh, final pieces done. So we've got barriers that have gone in place this week, ends of the bridge. Uh, there still is some riprap work to do with the, the larger rock below. Uh, the river's come down now, so we're cracking the whip and we expect that to be done next week. We had a meeting this week and they've tightened up their timelines. Uh, I want to see a, a line painted on it and cleanup done and them out of here by the end of July. That's the target. So we're... Uh, we're keeping on them. The pump track that we've been considering has been included in the park study. So uh, as Steffi and I think Sarah have made their way and just got sometimes through the community to get some feedback and some surveys done, uh, we've been capturing feedback on the on the pump track and we'll we'll have some some numbers and some results fairly soon, I think. I think she captured another 100 people today. So we're compiling some good stuff. Uh, GIS for the Owl Head Upper Trail, as we've shifted now to the upper part, it's been completed. And Shoe Shop Trail Alliance has reissued notifications done a few weeks ago uh, as per our phasing changes. And we're now hoping the province can turn around an updated Section 57 for us. Uh, the environmental study was completed this morning, so that's got submitted as well. So I'm really hoping we can uh, at least get some traction by fall and get something going over there, even if it is on the upper part. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant, we are in testing mode. As, as you know, all the pieces are in place, and we've designated the next three, four months to just uh, taking samples, sending them to the lab, and, and seeing where we are with that. Kerr Road Culvert has uh, been a, a challenging project for a culvert. Uh, we've jumped through a ton of hoops with the regulators, Flynn Row, DFO, MOE. We've had environmental plans done, work plans done. We finally got permission all the way down the line and we're ready to jump for August. And so we've gone back to the engineer who's recommended the, the culvert that we need. And he's informed us that what was once quoted at fifty-six thousand dollars for a culvert last year is now one hundred fifty thousand. So we we budgeted at one ninety for the overall project, and all of these studies and all these work plans, uh, we have to pay for that stuff. So my my decision has been: let's take possession of this culvert. And we're going to take another run at installation for next year. We'll put it in the budget and we'll we'll go at it again. But let's get that thing in before it goes up another 30%. It's been going up 30% on certain months, the steel. And uh, yeah, the costs are just incredible. So we'll do what we can this year. We'll secure it. The work plan, we'll be able to transfer that to a, a subsequent year. Or we'll do it next year. Um, 
the environmental plan, nothing will really change with all that hazard mitigation stuff. So we've got all that work done and nothing's really gonna change. So we'll be able to reapply much of the same stuff. Hopefully just throw a little in the budget for installation next year. So that's where we're at. Um, so I will order it, get a picture of it and I'll probably put it up in one of these updates sitting in our yard. Findlayson boat launch is moving ahead. Uh, we're moving ahead with permits. We've been discussing how we're going to coordinate all this work with MOTI. So we've had some discussions with them again and, and recently. Uh, a grant application was submitted to UBCM on June 30th. And uh, it's been a tremendous amount of work done internally to get that done. I had not a huge part in it, but we've got our our part in and 51 pages off to the, the grant authorities. So the design that we've submitted includes a commercial lane to the south of the lookout and then four lanes to the north of the lookout with two floating docks that kind of separate the four lanes. Uh, I, I laid it out before, but that's that's what we're asking for. We've also included a third dock in this grant application, which would replace the existing dock that's adjacent to the parking area. So when you walk down and go around that dock, we're looking to replace that one as well. Uh, a couple other items we threw into the grant, which is 100% funded, was uh, an upgrade to the storm outfall that leads in front of Reds and, and down to the water. Uh, replacement of the Gabians to the south edge of the parking lot. So not to say we're gonna replace it with Gabians, that piece of it we've identified and put a chunk of money we're asking for included in that. And that could be sheet piling or that could be new gabions. Uh, a fortified sim boom we did just for boats that stall when they're firing up and drift into the swim area. And then some street furniture for the area. So, so yeah, grant submitted. And I don't know when we'll hear back, but I, probably a couple of months. Right. Longer. Longer. And just so everybody's aware, the grant we ended up by submitting was for 3.562 million. So that's what, what we. Six one. Six, about six and a half. Yeah. Three and a half, sorry. Okay. Three and a half million. Yeah, yeah, right in there. Okay. Uh, a couple other little things. Charging station for the Pacific Center has been ordered. I, I phoned yesterday. I'm trying to get an update on where it is coming. Beach Park. We've got most of our, our pieces in place. Uh, I've got a, a couple of little picnic tables that are gonna go by the concession. Those will have to be put together. We're just waiting for the ground to kind of dry out a little bit so we don't rut things up going in there. And then the artwork from Saskia should have been done July 1st, or we were anticipating. Uh, they're, they're talking August 8th now. So those pieces will come in and kind of finish off the park. Uh, we could probably, if it's possible, flip to the one slide, and we we did we did uh, round out some of our capital purchases for this year. We got our flat bottom twelve foot flat bottom boat for the guys, and they're they're really happy about it. So um, we'll be able to do swim ropes and dock or, or just some some of our repairs on the docks and debris removal and all kinds of stuff. So. Way better than the tippy boat that I've seen them out there in trying to fix ropes and just about going over. So uh, came in on budget. And so thank you for that. Questions? Dr. Malmas? Yeah, through the chair. Good job, Daryl. Uh, but again, I get nervous when we start talking about projects that are going to be a year in the future, the amount of money we got for grant funding, like, I don't know how we can convince, uh, I mean, so what if you'd applied for $4.6 million and you only use 3.6, you don't get the 4.6, you get the 3.6, but it seems that we always get the 3.6 and then the job's worth 5.6. So somewhere along the way here, we got to do a catch up. Your culvert is a perfect example. Mm. 50,000, 150,000, and, and, and we just keep budgeting so far under that we got to keep amending our budget or some things have to go by the wayside. So 
I don't know how we, I said this a long time ago, somehow we got to get these class C bids up the bridge, 4.6, it's 6 million. I'm just going like, and when you get a grant for that, there's only one person left over that pays the difference. So it's the same as everything we do, the wellness center, the rest of it, like you get a grant to do it and it's, that's the budget. But by the time we get to it and get done with arguing with the community about things, the price of it goes up. So it's, you gotta find a way to fix that, the grant applications. Carol, go ahead. Yeah, through the chair and the point taken. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing how things can change quickly with pricing. We did give this a healthy 30% uh, extra. Contingency is 30, solid 30. So I think, well, good. Maybe it'll be. And you know, when, when so this particular grant funding stream is, is $100 million shared by all of BC. So there's a fine little line between asking for the max and because they have to distribute it all all across BC. So it's not a ton of applications that they approve. So it's it's a little bit of a dance, but I hear you loud and clear. And we did put a 30% contingency on there. Well, that's good. Glad to hear that. Good job. Bob, go ahead. Uh, you know, just case in point, I have a friend building a house. And when he started the project, uh, the trusses were literally three times cheaper than they are now. And he was shocked. He thought it was a mistake and asked, couple different people know trust has gone from 13 to forty thousand dollars that's just everything's just gone nuts colleen um just sorry what did i think here before um daryl on this project what was the um the cost for the engineering environmental all the studies done to replace that one culvert like what was the overall cost of that without any equipment before they even Picked up a shovel. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, good question. I'd be guessing right now. I could take it as an information request and, and get it back to you. Can I? Can I go ahead? Um, I would. And I think that there should be some pushback on stuff like that. I think that the government is being a little bit um, um, aggressive with some of their requests and some of the layers that they're putting on municipalities to deal with. So I think that we should have a look at that and other projects. And I think that we should, I don't know, perhaps put in a resolution to uh, Silga coming because that'll be our next um, um, uh, meeting, big meeting of, of our area. So uh, perhaps we can look at that and start pushing that back at them. Just a suggestion. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, you do that and you get a little tick from that government agency puts you in the bottom of the list for anything. Future. Yeah, I don't. I, other communities have better be dealing with this too, not just. I, it's, no, I, yeah, I hear you. So, Councillor Anderson, are you putting together a resolution, a motion on the floor at this stage? Yeah. Yeah, no, not right now. Uh, staff will draw. We'll look at it. Councilor Bushel. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, Daryl, um, yeah, good job with your team and everything. Um, thank you. Um, quick question on the uh, parking signs by Sigmund Southport. Are we, are we going to put in our own in there? I can't remember where we left off with that because I, I got a pretty nasty uh, parking ticket there the other day, personal one. <laughs> no parking, but I can't speak the third word. <laughs> Somebody just put it on my windshield, and I was in the district property. <laughs> in the district property, hmm. and uh, I just wanted to, you know, because I'd hate like uh, for a tourist to get that one. There. You know, tourists keep getting those. Through the chair, was that a, a warning from our bylaw, or the, the, just? Oh, it's just a, just a, just somebody put it on my windshield. So I just, you know, I, we should be, you know, if we're allowed to park there, we should have signs there that this is signals, you know, uh, right away, and we're allowed to park there. And maybe I can do a tour with you and I can show you. Hey, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Sure. All right. Any other comments or questions for Daryl? All right, we'll move on then. Thanks, Daryl. Okay. Bylaw enforcement, Jen, do you want to give us an update on this? I will play the role of John tonight. And I'm really glad that John didn't issue that nasty note. 
Um, he's been super busy, um, just out there enforcing parking as a primary. I think over two days, he said he had like 48 tickets issued over one weekend. Um, so he's just out there um, following uh, council's direction, especially on parking. And I'm also very pleased to say that we have hired a community ambassador who will be out there to support Don so we can increase our bylaw enforcement service delivery. Uh, I thought it was going to be a unicorn to find, but we, we found her and so she'll be starting on Monday. Her name is Sierra. We'll get her donned in Sycamus swag and send her out there with bylaws in hand and uh, looking forward to that additional support. And I don't know if there's any questions about bylaw. I can try and answer if there is, but, uh, or I can get back to you. <clears throat> Questions about bylaw. All right, we're hearing none. Thanks, Jen. Okay, community services, Jason, you're up. Thank you, Worship, to the chair. Um, I'm gonna keep this really short, short today. Uh, some of my nations that recreation may be talking too much, so we'll just keep it short. Um, I heard the chief on just to pass along that he has got, picked up his fourth crew member uh, for his summer, for a summer crew, and they are primarily working with uh, seniors and disadvantaged um, homes uh, to make their homes and their grounds safer. Right now, that's where they're working. They're the senior centers where they spent most of last week or so, a lot of work to do behind those buildings and whatnot, but that's where he's working at as far as that goes. Uh, facility is similar to Jen, very excited to say as, as July 25th, um, the district has hired um, a new building inspector that will be starting then, but that person also will spend in two days a week with the community services um, and be my facilities person to help me out with a lot of the stuff that's going on around there. Um, so we're gonna find him a new home, get him some tools, get him set up, get a plan going, and, and I have a, a backlist of stuff that could be done in facilities um, that they're gonna start on. This individual not only is uh, trained as a building inspector, they're also a journeyman carpenter and a plumber. Um, so that definitely got some skills that we can utilize in our facility. So pretty excited uh, about getting him on board um, as far as that goes. Um, also in the facilities, um, I did receive an engineering report from the Red Barn as to, I know the council is aware that they need to jack up the building and whatnot. Uh, that engineering report is, is without them speaking to, I don't want to go too far, but it's much, much worse than that. Um, to the point that effectively the only way they can can lift up the middle of the building is to remove all the additions that have been added to it along the years. So needless to say, the cost on that project potentially just went skyrocket to the roof if, if it's even reasonable for that facility. So still working with them and talking to them about where the next steps are, but um, it really, really dramatically changed the, the scenario as far as that goes. Um, in, in terms of recreation, uh, you've, <laughs> July is our, our crazy month. Um, obviously, we've had Canada Day. Uh, for those of you who participated, we did the Splatfin um, barbecue um, a couple of days ago as well down there. Um, canoe ceremony just took place in, in Beach Park today. Um, we we're down there. The mayor, will, I'm sure, will talk about later as far as that goes. Um, we've had some weather delays in some of our programming. <laughs> we're, we're either roasting or drowning, uh, it seems, in one, one way or the other. Um, so we're pushing some programming back. Case in point, our movie in the park, we're moving it back because we usually start that 8.30 at night, but in Finlayson Park, 8.30 at night is pretty much bright sunshine. And unless you want me to go out and buy a $20,000 projector, um, we're not going to cut it with our equipment. So we just bounce that back a couple of weeks. So hopefully it gets darker and we'll put it under the tent back at Beach Park now that the water's receding. Um, and coming up very quickly, uh, this weekend is Stomp. Um, we've been working with them a lot in the last week for the final details and whatnot. The um, weekend after that is Monashi, and then the weekend after that is the August Long Weekend event. So we have event after event after event coming through the, this, this month, uh, and uh, we're just continuing to work on that, especially with Public Works as well, to get that all assigned. So if you have any questions on any three of those department areas, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Comments or questions? Go ahead, Gord. <clears throat> Through the chair. Um, yeah, uh, Jason, uh, thank you very much for being able to attend the barbecue at Splatson. And I think Bob was there, and I'm not sure if, uh, who else was there. Terry, I think, was there too. And it, uh, you know, just shows uh, how, how we heard today from Splatson uh, how, you know, the, uh, our two councils are working close together and our communities are. And uh, yeah, it went really well. Uh, went really well. And thanks very much for. You know, doing all that in that big heavy heat. I hear Jamie had a got pretty hot. <laughs> we put Jamie in the freezer for a little while to cool her off. She was looking like she was going to faint. I was, I'm joking. We just actually put her in the freezer. So, <laughs> and, uh, and then I got some other stuff. I'll talk on my council report. Thank you. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Colleen. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I guess there's a lot going on. Um, just a quick update on the Monash Music Festival. Um, is everything come together as far as the parking and they've got all of their permits and a camping figured out? And I, I have a, a report later in the bylaw section that'll address some of that okay. entirely uh, as far as that goes. But yes, for what they, they're doing, it's all addressed. Their numbers are quite low. Um, compared to what we were initially looking at. So, the, the, I mean, we, we initially were thinking 3,000 people per day. Um, right now, I believe the ticket sales are are below 1,000 for the two days. So so it's combined. So we're not looking at the same kind of numbers um, in, in that way. Um, they're hoping for a lot of pickup at the door coming through on the weekend or whatever else. So hopefully the numbers will come up considerably from where they are right now. Um, but... Um, but yes, they've got everything in place, as well as Stomp now has everything in place for their events uh, that should should be fine. Can I just go ahead? And thank you for organizing and helping with the spot scene canoe for, uh, journey. I think it was it's really important for our community, as well as uh, when they got to uh, Old Town Bay, they were very grateful and uh, talking about uh, we need to get our council back together and have regular council council again. So Great. it's really good. Yeah, thank you. And any other comments? All right, thanks, Jason. All right, um, <clears throat> building and development. Who we got is going to be involved. <laughs> so we, we have got, a uh, lovely PDF with Sarah? numbers. <clears throat> Through the chair, yeah. I can answer questions about uh, the current applications PDF for planning permits. I apologize, I didn't prepare for anything to do with the building permit process. All right. Anyone has any questions about any of these files? I'm happy to. Uh, okay. Comments or questions? Yeah. Bob, it's just good to see. Uh, we got a lot going on. Going on. Yeah. Right. Uh, administration. Kelly. Yep. Um, so I'll be pretty brief. I just wanted to give uh, council an update on a couple of projects. Uh, one is just an update with MOTI and uh, the Green Bridge. We had a meeting, just a brief catch up uh, last week, and we have a draft. Um, RFP for parking. So for the replacement of the um, truck and trailer parking, as well as the car parking, and a little piece of, of dock as well. So it's quite long. We ha haven't even had a chance to look at it yet, but the plan is hopefully to get it issued at some point uh, prior to the end of August. So it'll come to council. It's just more FYI. And in, in addition, there's a cost sharing agreement. So they're two separate documents in which MOTI will pay us a certain amount for this parking. We will pay the proponent. So that, that will be coming out in the near future. And they're planning on coming to council and doing public meeting uh, at some point in August. Um, the term of this RFP um, is for a five-year uh, parking replacement starting uh, in like May of 2023 for a five-year window. They figure three-year construction window and then two years of buffer just in case because everything takes longer. Um, so, so that was a, that update. Um, housing project update. I've spoken with um, Rona Martin, BC Housing, um, as well as... Um, the engineer working um, with Eagle Valley Housing Society. And I've got a meeting with um, Bill Miller on, um, on Friday in terms of the housing project. Uh, BC Housing has asked for a comprehensive, no, no, like a mini site plan for the entire two projects. So Eagle Valley's as well as ours. Uh, and they said they would pay for it. So I am sourcing out some architects to give me a quote in terms of how much that site plan would cost so that everybody can approve the site plan, Eagle Valley, as well as the District of Sycamus, then we can sever the lamp however we need to, and then we can move forward. So I will report back on that. I'm talking to Bill Miller, because BC Housing actually, they, BC Housing wants to see this project move forward, so they've asked the district to take the lead on that, recognizing we don't have a cost-sharing agreement yet, but we, we will get one. 
And last but not least, a little uh, update on 200 Main. Uh, next week, uh, there will be some archaeological and geotech work done there. Um, and then in addition, there will be geotech work done on 417 and 425 Main Street. So it should be all done uh, most of next week. And we will be putting out a little notification for the public sometime tomorrow, probably. How much are questions for Kelly? Job, Kelly. All right. Thanks, Kelly. All right, uh, moving on, strategic priorities. Anybody want to comment on any of the strategic priorities right now? Go ahead, Councilor McCabe. Thank you. Um, just on uh, uh, the District of Sycamore's Housing Committee, we are, um, as a committee, when I say we, uh, Councilor Malmuth, Council Ryan, Aries, and myself, and uh, Siobhan Rich and who's the other two? Brenda. Thank you. Brenda Tizel. Yeah. And Brenda and uh, Tyson. 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 But anyhow, um, we're trying to take advantage of uh, utilities bill going out in the mail. And uh, so we, at the stage in our housing committee, that we're entering into uh, public engagement. And so, um, this is a one-page flyer. Does everyone have it? Or just, yes, definitely. Yeah. Everyone's got the example of the one-page flyer. So what we're going to be doing, this is just a heads up to the community. We're going to be doing pop-ups around town, um, like at the senior center. And um, help me out there, Sarah. Where, where are all the pop-ups going? We've been discussing at the farmer's market, senior center. We'll, of course, need to reach out to those um, properties and make sure that they're okay and set gates through there. Uh, and a lot of the community members, quite a few have also set forward, wanting to buddy up with district staff on those pop-ups to be reaching out to the community. Hey, so uh, yeah, it's just uh, you have the paper in front of you, but but could quickly read it? Go ahead, thanks. Uh, the housing committee is working to develop a housing strategy based on the findings of the 2022 housing needs assessment and community need. The housing committee is excited to share what they've been working on and receive feedback from the community. Uh, so beginning in August 2022, I look for booths and displays around the community, like at the farmer's market, senior center, and, and other areas, uh, and more about the draft housing strategy to provide feedback. Then there'll be a survey starting uh, August 1st that can be completed online or on paper. And, and there's a link in the handout for that. And any questions, call our, our planner, Sarah Martin. So in a housing needs assessment, uh, the gaps that were identified for Sycamus is basically across the spectrum, uh, affordable housing, rental housing, special needs housing, seniors housing, and the priority groups that uh, we're focusing on are seniors and young, young adults with uh, being singles and couples and uh, low-income households, families, and seasonal workers. Just a quick update, just to share with council and the community. And Councilor McCabe, any questions? All right, any more concerns regarding the priorities? Okay, we're hearing none, so we're gonna move on. Okay, we're under council's report. Council Bushley can start off. <laughs> I wasn't ready. <laughs> no. uh, excuse me, Chair. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say Canada Day events uh, went really well. I, uh, uh, it was nice to see some of the events starting to happen again after two years off. Um, the hockey tournament was great. Uh, we attended a little bit of that. And then I was over to the music, well, the music in the park, or not music in the park, but over the uh, over at the uh, Innocent place and the car show, everything went really well over there. Um, yeah, I attended, a, I was online today for the Caribou Recovery Meeting uh, today, and uh, it's uh, they're really looking like they're going to put the clamps down on uh, our area here because there's only a couple uh, couple uh, in the herd left. They might transport them but uh, and, and take them somewhere else, but it's uh, looking good. But we do have Natalie. She's on it, really. She's been writing letters and talking to all the uh, uh, the biologists and the, and the caribou people, and uh, along with um, Revelstoke Club and uh, our rec officer as well, because we want to keep Queest open. 
so yeah, that was interesting meeting. Um, also, oh, I, I was able to spend some time with Jason and Jamie again at the uh, Eagle's Nest, went through the Eagle's Nest uh, and had a good look at, you know, after a year, good, you know, use of the facility and it's, uh, what, it, you know, there's a few problems there we're going to work on and a few things that we're going to recommend after we put a list together, we'll get it off to Daryl and, uh, and take a look at it. Um, also went through the curling rink as well, where we're doing that today. And uh, just had a good look at the curling rink and, and same thing for that. You know, we had to look at upstairs and uh, a few things that uh, they want on their, on their back. But yeah, so that was interesting. Um, I was also attended the, the canoe, uh, pulling together canoe journey today at the, at, the, at the beach park. That was pretty emotional and pretty uh, interesting um, uh, 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 presentation today by all of the folks there. And, it was just, you know, pretty, pretty amazing to stand on that bridge and look at all those people paddling through uh, Mary Lake and uh, um, also just to remind everybody, we have the short term rental open house coming up this week. I think it's on the 15th and uh, that's about it. Thank you. Walter Anderson. I don't want to follow Councillor Bushel because he's like on his game. Um, I, I attended the active open house, uh, met with the the board and Carly. It was a, it was a very good event. Um, lots of information. We're going to see if uh, perhaps we can put uh, something together and just have a, a conversation with them. Um, I was at uh, Old Town Bay today when the spot scene arrived with their canoes and 200 people and getting them uh, disembarked and onto buses. And uh, it was it was a very interesting and very rewarding event. Like I, I felt, you know, um, really good. And uh, they are, uh, they are very appreciative and have a great mission. Um, um, that was, uh, that was, it was, it was really good to be a part of. Um, the Sycamus Visitor Experience Guide is out for those of you that haven't picked one up lately. This is like a pretty Pretty skook of a uh, guide for Sycamus. And I just want to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce, Tourism Advisory Committee, as well as the uh, the businesses that contributed to this, as well as the MRDT tax money that uh, was put forward in this. We now have a, a product that showcases Sycamus in the area quite well. So uh, thanks to all of those uh, folks that were involved in that. Um, Short-term rental, I'm, that's it. That's it for me, thanks. Councillor McKay, you're up. That's too hard acts to follow. Uh, not much here. Uh, Councillor Bushell and myself are, are attending a council council meeting with Splatson on, on Monday, I believe. Um, that's the first one in since the uh, new Splatson council has been elected since their elections. Uh, so we're keeping that, that going. And uh, one of the members is Teresa uh, William and talk to her today. She's looking forward to meeting next week. And yeah, so I was, I went to the uh, uh, beach park today to welcome the canoers in. Their tradition is to um, ask them to get off the canoe to get onto the shore. Uh, but Splatson doesn't feel they need permission because this is their um, uh, territorial, their, 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 their original home site. But even the other bands with Splatson, they need permission. The history behind that is because uh, when they had their war parties uh, invading other other bands, they would sneak up at night, usually by canoe. So, uh, oh, back in the day, when you when you go to someone else's territory, you ask permission to come come on to land off the canoe. <laughs> Otherwise, it could be bad news. So, um, when I was there, and, and they were so appreciative of of Jason and, and Jen and and Councillor uh, Evans uh, and. All the, all the people helping serve lunch in Enerby, over 200 people that I didn't help at all, but standing there, you know, getting thanks and kind of feel guilty a bit. But um, that really helped develop our, uh, maintain our relationship to show that we left our community to go to their community to help them in their efforts, which really, really helped us in our relationship. So thank you guys for doing that. It's very, very appreciated. They're very appreciative. I'm very appreciative. Um, that's about it. Um, went to music in the park. Um, beer is still five bucks a can. Good to see. And that's about it. 
Thank you, Councillor Erie. Uh, well, this is the most time I spend away from work during daytime hours. So I, uh, I haven't been uh, up to much. I'm talking a bit about communities in bloom with Dev. Even got my hands in the dirt briefly, but she's a more eloquent speaker than me, and she knows knows a little more about the current details. So I'll, uh, I'll let her speak that. Otherwise, uh, it's been housing meeting, as, as Gord spoke about extensively. Sarah's actually doing a good job of making housing interesting, which has made the <laughs> meetings great to go to. <clears throat> and uh, I'm really uh, appreciative for that. It's surprisingly engaging if people uh, people came to the meetings. <laughs> Uh, but I know, I know folks do watch watch them online. Some some good content there. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Councilor Thomas, I too attended the housing committee meeting. Uh, and Sarah did a good job, but I I think we made a point that there was nobody online and there was only three chairs and they were empty, so there wasn't much attendance out of them. So. Uh, and that is a problem in the community that we have these open houses, we have these public forums, and we don't get any attendance. And then we we start making decisions, figuring everything's good, and then people come out of the woodwork after going, "Well, we didn't know anything about that." Well, you don't attend the meetings, you're not going to know what's going on. That's that's my pet peeve. Canada Day, I think, was a great success. I uh, I'm not 100 percent comfortable with the idea that we canceled the fireworks because. Debris on the lake. I don't know where that came from or who came up with that one because it's the same time every year and there's the same amount of debris every year, just about. So, you know, uh, when we had a flood in 2012, yes, we cast because we cast like this cold. Uh, I don't remember too many other cancellations of Canada Day with the fireworks on the lake because the, the high water. Loosens up the stuff that comes to rest on shore. It happens every year. It's been going on for centuries. So I don't know how that decision happened, but I, I, I know there's a lot of people look forward to the fireworks, and we haven't had it for some time now. And then they cancel it at the last minute again because of too much debris. I, I don't personally, I didn't agree with it. So then I attended the car show. I was there flipping burgers, and that was the, we were. In the wrong location we moved, got to the right location set up, turned on the barbecues, and it was like flip, 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 flip. We got rid of 150 burgers in an hour and 20 minutes. So we could have had a few more, but it was it was pretty hectic over there. Uh, I think the car show turnout was fantastic. They had 150 cars. It was a it was a lot of ice iron over there. Uh, and, and it was well attended. There were a lot of people outside of the meeting, but actually owned the cars there. <clears throat> it was a great event. I'm looking forward to the stall for the monastery and the other events going forward on the weekends because that's what we used to do. So that's my reason. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thanks. I, uh, I'll start with Canada today. It was great to see us use the new uh, tennis courts and that beautiful new pavement and the excitement around that. I got a great picture of these little guys just waiting for their turn at the road hockey tournament. They were geared up, ready to go, just like ready to go. It was just exciting and see all the people around there. So I want to thank our hardworking staff. These guys are tired because they, uh, they did Canada Day. And then um, I want to thank them for their hard work and amazing preparation for the, uh, the, the uh, barbecue uh, burgers and hot dogs that we had in uh, in Enderby that was so well prepared and uh, all I had to do was find out where people were from and it, and had no cheese that was my job but um, <laughs> uh, that cheesy job was excellent because um, it was like Gore said great to see people from all over the place Vancouver the north of BC back from Halifax all coming together to do this uh, canoeing event that was that was pretty great so I want to thank the staff for that. And um, <clears throat> also want to um, thank uh, anybody out there that has contributed towards this uh, family from Ukraine that is now settled in town and doing well. And the, the community has really stepped up and given towards that and, and it's really helping them out. So thanks for that.
All right, thanks, Bob. <clears throat> so yeah, Kennedy was a success, uh, and it's a success for two reasons, and yeah. um, uh, thanks to the staff, but also thanks to the volunteers, car show especially, uh, volunteers that uh, stepped up and made it happen. Uh, they had, uh, I think, 50 cars that were registered, and they ended up with just under 150 cars. So that was so. Uh, that was quite. Uh, it, was, it was nice to see that uh, the pulling together canoe uh, trip. Um, uh, we did put on a barbecue in uh, Enderby, and it was successful. We cooked, I think, Jason, around 225 burgers and around 80 hot dogs, and they all went. So. Thanks to staff uh, and, and uh, volunteers for that as well. Um, so uh, Economic Trust of the Southern Interior, there's $3 million of the grant money that they put out every single year. Uh, it's a program uh, that's been put together by the province. Uh, it uh, covers from Elkford to Hope and uh, uh, all the communities in between, uh, Cranbrook and Creston and and Lona and and um, Astoria, Oliver, Sick Moose, and so forth. Anyway, I have the opportunity to be elected to be the next chair board of that particular organization. So I'm stepping up, and I took uh, the honor. Um, uh, one of the main functions of that particular organization is to support economic development and uh, and small businesses and. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very, very good program. Um, emergency planning uh, and uh, the issues out at two mile and uh, with the snow, with the rain and uh, and the uh, snowpack and so forth. And now the lake's going down and uh, and uh, the people out there are getting a little bit more relaxed. Thank goodness. And uh, the creek is actually running quite clear. So. Anyway, uh, I think we're dodging the bullet there. So that's pretty much my report and we'll move on. Fixed or there's no way we're doing a fixed contract. So uh, is there anybody on that would like to speak that's on? I think that was an accident. Uh, should we, uh, we have this motion to rise out of committee hall and adopt the recommendations? Oh yeah, we can do that. Recommendation that the committee of the whole now rise and report and that the recommendation from July 13, 2022 committee of the whole be adopted. I need a mover. Councillor Aries, Councillor Evans, all in favor. Carried, thank you. Okay, anybody online that would like to? If there's anybody online that would like to address council, please raise your hand. All right, not seeing anything. Okay. I would open up the floor for comments from the gallery, but uh, I see that there's a couple of delegations here. So uh, I'm going up the floor for the delegations right now. So, Deb, Communities in Bloom, your comments, please. This actually would. Uh, you know what, I don't need you know that. Um, so uh, my main reason for being here tonight is to talk about the judges are coming in uh, Monday through Wednesday of next week. So I've been talking to some of you individually. I sent some emails out and such, but basically they're going to be arriving on the Monday. I've done the best I could to try and limit how much I'm drawing on staff because I, and council because I know you guys are all crazy busy just like I am. Um, but basically, I just wanted to give you the rough itinerary. And so the judges are coming in on Monday. The first thing we're going to do is Jeff is going to take uh, the judges and I up to the lookout. And in his role as the chair of the planning committee and his portfolio of public works, the idea is that we've got a very good vantage point up there for the judges in terms of saying this is so that when to put it in context for them through the rest of the trip. So this is where that is and everything and, and be able to speak to all of that. Uh, once we come back, uh, we'll be heading to the Legion for a barbecue. Uh, we've selected the Legion because it's been a feature. It's actually been the longest feature project of ours in terms of, uh, you know, like things going on there for three years. And the Legion is quite happy to prepare the barbecue for us. 
Um, so as far as that, uh, Greg uh, always says Greg can attend that, and I'm expecting that the, the mayor will attend that. We'll be doing a bit of a meet and greet with the judges. If there are any of you that can't make uh, the Tuesday or Wednesday and would like to come out and meet the judges, absolutely. My only request is I need to know sooner rather than later because we've got to come up with the amount of food for the judges so uh, right now like i said I'm, I'm not planning for a big group uh the key volunteers having them out too but you know it, like i said you're you're all welcome but i i just need to know and and uh be able to pin those numbers down um <sighs> Mother Nature's kind of screwing with me a bit uh, because after the Legion, the intent was to walk down Main Street and to talk about uh, certain uh, things that are going down on down there as we're passing by, stopping at Rudy Ross to meet with Brenda, talk about the Red Barn, go over to the train bridge and go to music in the park, which is not going to be happening there. So it's just, uh, it's going to be a little tricky because of course, music in the park is one of the feature projects of Sycamus, ties in with all of the communities in Bloom criteria. You know, it's, it's kind of important. So I'm thinking we'll probably do something with that on Wednesday. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the rest of Tuesday, but I'm not really, ex uh, rest of Tuesday, the rest of Monday night, um, possibly take them to Finlayson. The tough part with that is that it's to hear music. We don't have anything going on over there that I particularly want them to see, so I'm still thinking on that one. And uh, I was going to send you guys a draft itinerary, but I decided it was better to not do it until such time as it's actually finished and finalized, because otherwise you guys are, you know, are you looking at the right one or the wrong one? I figured I'd just go through this with you. So the uh, on the Tuesday, um, the there's no restaurants open. Tuesday mornings and Wednesday mornings in Sycamus. So we're, we're winging it a bit. Uh, Tuesday, we will go to the bus stop. We've got that sorted out. And uh, then we will be doing, uh, I've been talking to Jen about taking John's truck out to the Ukrainian internment camp memorial, stopping at the uh, caboose on the way back. I've been speaking to the elementary school. Hazel is going to show the judges her buddy bench. Um, there's some planters there too that unfortunately the teachers can't make it for, but they've given me the information to speak to it. Possibly stopping off at the water treatment, depending on how things are coming together, but for a little bit quicker than we normally do because we'll be speaking to that uh, back here. Uh, then we're going to actually, I guess, come back, get the electric car from Red's Rentals, uh, stop at the Bottle Depot, the Resource Center, Seniors Housing. Um, seniors Housing has been another big area we've been spending uh, a lot of resources, uh, volunteer resources on. And then back to the DOS for 1 p.m. And that's where those of you that I have tagged with doing things uh, will be coming in. So I'm hoping that we can actually just get a lunch brought in. And that way, uh, Tuesday's always got a tight timeline because the judges have to be back and working on their, their notes and that by three o'clock. So one o'clock in here, going through the criteria that I'd said before. Um, I think, yeah, like I say, I've, I've talked to most of you, so I don't think there's anything, we don't have to go through all the details. I know you've got a long meeting here. Um, the other part will then be to head to the museum for the heritage part of it at the discussion with Hannah and Dean and, and some of those. So I've, I've worked that all out with them. Uh, judges have an afternoon break. We're uh, talking to Bryant about having a boat ride and then, you know, like still trying to pin down exactly what we're doing about dinner that night since no restaurants are open. <laughs> there, there is a couple. I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but it is a little tricky fitting restaurants that are in the vicinity of where we are and, and such because most of them are shut down. Um, Wednesday morning, I'm going to make a light breakfast with the help of Ryan. He's going to give me some local berries for him to make it seem like it was an intentional thing as opposed to 
no restaurants being open. And then we'll do that at the pop-up garden and talk a bit about that there. And then uh, go from there um, to the cemetery and then over to the beach park. They seem to be staying a little longer than on Wednesday than normal. So I'm thinking a uh, light lunch at high because they don't open until 11 o'clock to finish off and do the bye-byes and, and see you later with the judges. So that's the high level plan. Um, I have to thank, you know, like as far as Jen and Sarah and Camden and, and Daryl, and, and I've got some volunteers out there going nuts right now, so I wouldn't have been able to get some of them, but I really appreciate everybody scrambling. It's tricky every year because you want to get the best pictures, you want to get the best information, which means that you're waiting until the last minute, which is kind of crazy for everybody, but it's just the way things work. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, any questions or comments? Councillor Bushholt. Yes, through the chair, maybe for Jason and Daryl, but we were over at the park today at the beach, uh, the beach park and the water is actually gone down by Monday. It'll probably be completely gone out of the park. Would it not be okay to still have the music in the park there, I wonder? Do you know, Daryl? Through the chair, uh, it's like we're Wednesday tonight. Uh, I'm leaving and Everett's leaving and we're, we're short staffed. And to make the safest call, we've still got streetlights that are underwater over there. And I think it's not so much the park water that's going down that's, that we're looking at. It's, it's the transition through the, the parking lot underneath. Okay. And it's, still, it's still up to the benches. So we're days away and I'm hoping the week after we can get in there. But see and I can plan be like nobody's business, so it's it's all good. It's just if you want to, hey, no, but whatever. Okay. Yeah, I know, and there could be a lot. Like I forgot to mention in my council report, I did go to the music in the park, and and uh, it was like two probably two hundred fifty people there. It was it was really really popular. I'll take a ghetto blast when I think <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm gonna get somebody to sit on the job, <laughs> Good job, Deb. Thank you. Well, Deb, the uh, communities in bloom have come a long way, and I mean, COVID got in our way, and so, and we got the judges coming into town, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing them. And uh, uh, one point, um, Corey Miller called me, and I, apparently they got something out of paint the caboose. So, it. yeah, so it should be done by the time the judges get here. So that'll be a bonus as well. But Overall, thank you for all the hard work and looking forward to those judges and we'll nail those five rooms this year, I'm sure. <laughs> Good out there. And it's been, a, as you all know, a tricky spring because it was mm -hmm. late and things weren't growing and, and they're starting to look good now. So it's, uh, you know, given, given it our best shot, so. Yeah, honestly, you've done a great job. You and the volunteers, fantastic. All right, any other comments? Thanks, Deb. Good job, Deb. Thank okay. you. Moving on, uh, we have here uh, Greg Darrell. He is here as a delegation in regards to development permit 22143 DVP 181705 Hillier Road. Uh, Greg, uh, you have the floor, and then uh, we'll uh, have uh, Daryl call in. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, so my main issue is is the discuss you know the the decline of uh, lot 18 and you know the setback variance for uh, that fellow's deck that approaches the fire lane. But I, I wanted to you know just cover some other issues. Uh, you know we we. We do developments, we have planning departments, and we have council. You know, I develop in Mexico, Florida, Nevada, Alberta, all over. It's a similar challenge. And we do developments to attract, you know, residential housing largely. And through bureaucracy, we really forget about those people. We start these projects, and the intent is to provide a an affordable housing issue, the mobile park in the street, right? <laughs> Myself as a developer get wrapped up in the bureaucratic process and fight it. Staff is doing their thing, engineering is doing their thing, and then council is the catch-all of all of that. 
And I'm talking tonight because we forget who the important person is. And that's the important person that wants to move to Sycamus for retirement or for their life. And the mobile home park was back quite some time. You know, the, the Bear Land Strata Park didn't work. We couldn't sell it. CMHC wouldn't finance it. Had those challenges. So I said, let's go to that route. Went through that process. It was all good. It all got supported. Um, well, Linda was the planner then. Council voted on it. Said, oh, we want us to change my family. It's done. Approved. Done. Planning department team, engineering drawings went in, as per they do, right? They go through the process, engineering drawings. Um, new planner, you know, bylaws, everything's, everything's okay. Let's do a new development permit, which we did. Through that process, we need a landscape problem now, which, you know, I agreed to. That was all okay. And we'll put that in place. We met on site. At that time, it was a bulk water meter. That was demanded by staff. I checked with Wendy. You can't have individual meters. You have to do bulk. So that's okay. I'm paying for it. I can irrigate over the cedar. Everything's not an issue. Five permits get issued. People move in. Then it's decided we want individual meters. After engineering signed off, approved, I put up my $100,000. We gave it back. We changed our mind. So now I got to go back to all the owners and say, you got to have meters. After many of them signed agreements that water and sewer was in, I had to refund the money, everything. Okay. So now I was hoping people would water their backyards, right? And all the cedar. Nobody wants to do it because they have to pay for water. And cedars use a huge amount of water. That's why the delay, right? To try and so there, I'm getting all that backlash. So I don't now I've got to put irrigation in. I have no water connection. So I've got engineering working on how do I get a water connection of my own that I have to meter to water the cedars. Right. And I will tell you, you are the only community in North America that has a landscape buffer between two residential lots backing onto each other. The only one that you put a landscape buffer between two residential lots to back together. That's bureaucracy in the, in the highest extent. So I had a solution, everybody's happy. Emailed Scott and, you know, server, server replied that server did the proper thing. So I wanted to put maples, give the owners maples, plant them down the back, two per yard. They match the boulevard, same color, same everything, beautiful street scene. They use only 10% of the water that a seizure does. Email, got a reply, can't do it. Council supported the BP for seizures. They have to go into seizures every two meters. So that's the delay of why the back hasn't been built. Because this is a bureaucratic process. And I got to go back to engineering. I got to get a water line. I've got to get a put in. That's not the year deal. The maples were the perfect solution, but because you have a development permit that subsists on cedars, you have to do that. The cost is $75,000 to fix this. I've got the quote today, and that's why I'm up here. So that cost, I just take my cost and put it onto the development, and I'm going to recoup it through in this pattern. I started out with everything working at 385 a month, that's a 4% return. My next phase will be 500 a month for bad rent. Bureaucracy has increased $100 a month for a, for a family to move to Sycamus. Lot 18, we have a uh, you know, double there. So because of the bylaw, and more of the original development, the two lots on the end had to be shrunk from 14 meters to 11.94. The reason those two lots got narrowed is at the final hour, the District of Sycamus wanted a fire lane. You're the only subdivision, 35 lot subdivision, 
that has a fire lane in North America. Look how many roads you have to come in for a fire, but you want a fire lane. That land has to come out of the lots, right? So those lots on the end are all squeezed inside because I had to give up, I had to get the land from somewhere to give a fire lane. Will we see a fire truck? I hope we never see a fire truck. But because of the bylaw interpretation, you have a setback from a public road. I don't think a fire lane is a public road. It should have never come to council. It's not a public road, it's a fire lane, but it's interpreted by the bylaws that it is a, <clears throat> a public road. If it was the public road, the application wouldn't even been here. So we worked through the bylaws. We got it all sorted out and everything. Every application will be a DVP. I've hired the proper team, the $300 application fee, everything. I've told all the dealers, if you're coming, sending someone to Sycamus, charge them a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks to move to Sycamus. That's who's paying for it. It's the customer that is coming to move to your community because I'm not, I'm not paying for it. I've tacked it at all. Um, you know, you had a variance for the shed here, the 95 square foot shed. That you don't even need a building permit. <clears throat> we have to go. The guy can drive to Costco, pick up a shed and put it in his backyard, but in six weeks, he has to go through a complete process and come to council for a shed. That's bureaucratic process to the to its finals. So I can move the home. That was suggested. The trouble is I moved the home. Your other bylaw said you have to have six meters apart between homes. So now the lot beside is compromised because I need six meters. They're invisible property lines. I place the home to try and make the lot beside usable. So if I move this one back so the guy can have a den, I, I ruin the lot next door, which is on your map. So I'm asking council to reconsider the variance on this guy's deck. He's not encroaching on anything. He's looking at a, at a fire lane. You know, like if his house goes on fire, he's not sitting on his deck. It's just bureaucratic. It doesn't make any sense. I have to tell this fellow, you can't have a deck. It, it, it's just not right. Because it's not affecting anything, the very Not at all. And the, the services are dug in to move the home. It affects it by other lot beside it. It just doesn't make any financial sense. So, you know, I'm here tonight to, you know, if council will reconsider that. And if they won't, you know, let me know. I, I can move on. And, uh, but, but I wanted to, to speak more that um, the, the process in Sycamus has become, it's so bureaucratic. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And you've totally forgot about the family that wants to move here. Because everybody's doing their own thing and it's all politics. But how do you tell a 70 year old family about setbacks? They don't understand. They don't understand. And it is thick and sick. The bureaucracy is thick. All right. Thanks, Greg. Councillor Malmas, you've got a question or a comment? Well, as the guy who's the chair of the project development committee meeting, uh, we just asked a simple question, Greg, why that trailer was moved to where it was when it could have fit inside the box. And I asked that question, all right? It was not explained to us that that was a fire lane and that it did not actually need to be. It's not a roadway, it's a fire lane, so it's not going to get used to drive around on apparently, which makes a difference, all right? But the explanation that came back to us in writing on the document was is that that's where whoever put the services in place them, and that's where the trailer had to go because that's where they put the services at, so they lined up. And, and Jeff, that's me that said that. That's me that said that. Okay. So the dotted lines you see on the perceived plan are setbacks of like one, two meters, 1.2 meters. It's for the dealers to know where 
the general perimeter of, of a building area is. Yeah. What they don't know is that the lot next door still has to be six meters to the next house. So they're in bins, they're movable lines because a mobile home park is one title. They're sort of like little sites. I have to deal with all the bylaws of 1993 that dealt with the old traditional single line that was 12 feet wide. So and now I got homes that are 20 wide. So if I, I might just continue, uh, had it been explained that there was a fire lane there, not a roadway, because we gave in part to because they had a road and they wanted to offset because the same thing they had to make a couple lots smaller for roads and all sort of the same setbacks but that was for sight lines so if it's not a roadway it's a fire lane yes i agree with you that, that offset shouldn't have been six meters but nobody here got have that explained to them that when you get explained that it's where it's there because that's where the services were put, you're going okay. So, and that was the that was the stand kind of. If you're going to make a mistake, it's like the guy with the deck out onto the road, at the first place you drive into. Mm -hmm. He built it after facts, and and so we approved it. But if we're just going to keep approving things after the fact that somebody else makes a mistake, then basically there are no rules. So. But we sat down and we had a long conversation. We listened to what you had to say and with the defense of the staff and the planning development committee, the one lot where the people are, where they got the shed, the carport and everything else, we were using our 40% coverage rule, which is what the new way is going to be if we ever get the zoning bylaws passed, which was in discussions of having with you about what the coverage, because you're right, this is the new affordable house. Because the six hundred thousand dollars is not affordable, not for a guy working at Tim Hortons and her husband and wife working in the restaurant business. So, I agree with that. As far as the uh, cedars, want to switch them to oak. I think you could have came in and paid a three hundred dollar DP and had that changed, but maybe staff didn't tell you that. I don't know. I wasn't part of the conversation, but. As a developer, you should know that if, if that's the issue you're up against and you want to change it, this is the office that changes it. So you could have put in a DP and said, look, I can't afford to put cedars in because I got no water because of this, this, this. You, all the reasons you explained are somewhat valid. I don't so, think you can amend the DP again, sir. sir. You can indeed. And there is a little bit of rigor, wheel room with the cedars. So, but I guess... Well, so those options. The, the, the other wiggle room uses the same amount of water. It's the issue is the homeowner won't support watering them because they're paying a water bill. That's the issue. So I suggest that you put in a DP to change that, that because there's one coming in here for another piece of property about the fence at the back border and LR ALR land. So I'm a landscape buffer. I just want to do something that's going to be maintained and look nice and not die. Well, so those maple trees that you're talking about to change it from cedars to maples, put in a DP three hundred. The same ones on your boulevard. Daryl will say they last forever, and they don't use much water. So if you put in a DP and bring it back here, then it comes here and it gets voted on because actually the council has the authority to change. It. So that's a solution. That's a resource. So for me personally, from the planning and development committee meeting, the reason that I was recommended no to that was because whoever said that because you put the water and sewer in the wrong place, I wasn't going to consider that as a justified reason for it. But if the reason is because you have to have it because the current rules are still with six meters and you have to have it because that's not even a roadway, it's a fire lane, then I'm happy to change my recommendation that we approve it. So Sarah, is that a roadway or is that a fire lane? It's a fire lane. And if you were if you were to reapply for that variance for that one, we'd refer it to the fire chief and get his comments. So ahead of that time, we might want to discuss with the fire chief. If, it has to do with if the fire chief needs to use that lane to access the park because the other access is inaccessible because of fire. Right. So, and I think it's all something we can talk about and find a solution. No, but so what you're saying, and that's 
why I'm talking about bureaucratic process. So I'm going to pay another $300 to bring it back to this table. The guy can't move in and wait, right? Okay. And then the fire chief can say no. So whether or not he can have a deck affects whether or not his mobile home can be placed? Well, no, his deck, like his, you know, he wants to set on an eight-foot deck instead of a, a five-foot deck. But you're still going to have 2.6, 3.6 meters to the fire lane. Like the guy's only sitting on a wood deck and you're still 10 feet to the fire lane. Is it an issue? Like we're making mountains out of molehills. Like it's just not reasonable. And the consumer doesn't understand this. And it's hard for dealers, my staff, to explain to somebody that wants to move to Sycamus, you may get a shed, you may get a debt, you may not. That's the issue. That's what we've created here. Craig Gordon. I agree, excuse me, sorry, to the chair. I, I agree 100%. We're uh, making mountains out of moment. And uh, it's just, and this this bylaw, this old bylaw that we have that we're trying to tap dance around, I mean, it should be rescinded. We should rescind it right away and implement our new one until the whole bylaw comes into play because it's it's really having causing problems. All the developers over here, over here. and uh, our fire chief, you know, he's got to protect. You know, he wants to protect the district. He many times he's he's he said no, but uh, it still comes to council. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. And thank you, Greg, for coming in and telling us how frustrated you are. I appreciate that a lot because it's the only way we know that uh, there has to be some, it's a good impetus to change things quickly. So thank you. All right. Any other comments? Go ahead, Jeff. So is, is, is the promise that I made correct, Sarah? He has to pay the three hundred dollars to get a DP to change the steers to open. And does he have to apply for another DP for this, or can this one just for the number eight? Talking about the, the landscape buffer, yeah, I do believe that we would need an another application to amend the existing development permit, which is three hundred dollars. I believe so. Okay. For the other one, our corporate officer has advised that because that permit has already been approved and issued, we can't we can't do anything with that one. So they would need to make another application for a development variance permit specifically for the deck. So the other things were addressed, the other variances were granted, just the one for the deck was. <laughs> Just to, just to confirm, once the resolution has been acted on by an officer and employee of the district, it can't be reconsidered. That's just kind of the, the rules around them. Um, and the paperwork's already going, been filed and started with LTSA. The process has been started. So uh, instead, if council wishes, that, that one section could be brought forth for council and could always, of course, choose to waive the fee if you wanted to. For, for the uh, Yes, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So you waive the fee for the deck for the seniors? For the, the D, oh, sorry. So which one? Like not for the deck, but for the DVT. Uh, for lot 18, we're not talking about the landscape on the permit. We're talking about the variance for lot 18. After you waive that fee? If council decides to do so. 300 bucks won't change my life. I just pass it on to the next one. Well, that's what we're afraid of. <laughs> All right, thanks, Greg. Go ahead, Kelly. Um, no, I was just going to say, so if, if you did want to waive any fees, then we should make a resolution here and agree to it or not agree to it. Or either for the yep. plan on submitting another DVP for the deck. Kelly, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to submit a DP or a development permit, variance, whatever you're Sarah, or to go from Cedars to Maples. Um, and then I'm going to do one for lot 18 too. You guys can decide at that time if you want to reverse the fee or whatever. Mm -hmm. or, uh, okay. At that time, that's probably, I have enough money to make the application. Okay. I, don't have to move forward, but it's okay. I, I need, I just need to get stuff moving along. It's, it's the people out there that we're forgetting about that. Um, 
you want to get this solved and move on. All right. I'll leave you guys with some positive news. Well, you have a question? I just, Councilor Anderson, you had a comment? Yeah, I just have a question for Council. How can we move? Can we rescind uh, the bylaws? Can we move our current bylaw that's in the process right now forward and make the changes that are necessary to stop the frustration that developers are going through? No, no. I mean, you know, if Council rescinded its zoning bylaw, then you wouldn't have a zoning bylaw, right? And then we, wouldn't be able to regulate land use at all. And that is that's council's prerogative, certainly, but I don't believe that's the prerogative of council. And with the current zoning bylaw, the stages like that, it's got to go to public hearing first, and then it needs to go for third reading and final adoption. And those are the stages that it needs to go through. So uh, it wouldn't, it, it can be a decision today or anything. It's just got to go through the process yeah. to get moved. Yeah. It's okay. So, yeah, we've got the process down to hot and I'll. I'll probably catch a letter with the applications of, of other mobiles just explaining, you know, like some job doesn't get um, interpreted. And, and, you know, it probably poorly explained, you know, I've got set up with these stuff. So, so no, I, I'll, I'll personally make sure that it's not the intensity stuff. That I'll turn mom, let's go ahead. Uh, yes, Greg, we, I, I, I feel bad for this, but based on the information that we had, I had to go like we can't just keep allowing variances and stuff to go on because people are just building a deck. We got to give a variance for it. That deck that we passed actually was way offside. So, no, this guy's. Jeff, there's no hard feelings with anybody. I, I took up more time than I submitted to uh, Jennifer to, to be on the thing, but. Uh, I I personally wanted to speak on behalf of the developer about the frustration of bureaucrats and how it increases costs. And elected people today should be aware of that if you want to keep costs. And it's rampant everywhere. It's not sick of news, but it's getting worse here. And I think you need to hear about it. Greg, I'm sure that we recognize that we're in the game. You can be sure that regulation is becoming more onerous all the time, and a lot of it's coming down from the province, and it's uh, and what we deal with. And I and uh, us. we have to take a look at staff and 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 what they're dealing with. And going through the group, you uh, guys are seeing in your post. Yeah, a positive note. Um, you know, I have a project in the regional district. You're pretty familiar of Para Hills now. You know, Gulf North has got involved. They're going to deal with them. They're managing it for big time. Gulf. If the lawyers are still at work, they better be at work right now. Uh, I'm going to sign a disclosure statement tomorrow and um, be marketing 100 Fairlands Strata lots. Uh, the PA has put up with my sales trailer there and everything. So everything looks well. Marketing will get lit up on Monday, Tuesday, maybe in the regional district, but it's in Sycamus and probably 5,000 ads going out that's going to have Sycamus all over. So that's exciting. A long time coming through the process, but it should happen next week. But there, so that's you know, it's great for your community. Thank you. That project will be. Uh, a big asset to signal. Hey, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, have a good evening, guys. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so next in the delegation lineup, Mr. Steelingler, 200 Main Street. You have the floor, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City of Tonight, I'm going to tell a very aspect with two different groups. One, Strata, BC Strata 3136, and a group, a public group, uh, tagged as 200 needs. Uh, obviously, we, we haven't spoken since probably October, November last year. There hasn't been any meeting, I haven't heard anything or seen anything happen. We feel now as both groups, but 
time to talk again. Our reason is we are completely 100% in opposition to development of 200 plus, as you're aware. So I have some questions for you tonight. Uh, my first question is, on uh, May the 16th, it supplied to the District of Sycamus a letter of opposition addressed to past town manager and to yourself, Mr. Mayor. To date, I have received nothing in response. As requested, I've received nothing. Can anyone comment on that? Can I ask another question? Would that is that a proper procedure for the district to not respond to taxpayers or to groups? No, that is not proper procedure. Right. And if if we didn't get that, yeah. Their, their response. Yeah. Can uh, I ask? Did you, did you send it to me myself as well? No, I have it. Make sure I got the receipt it here. Stamped at your front desk. It went to Mr. Parliament, who's no longer with us. I understand. <laughs> and the right. Going forward, you're welcome to CC me on those. And I, I typically handle a lot of the correspondence for council. Yeah. Be well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, moving forward. Public input. What type of public input has the District of Sycamus given to date on this proposed development? What type of public input have you presented to the taxpayers of this community. And I'm not talking about the <laughs> information, little information gathering last fall over at the seniors complex to tell everyone what was going to be built, but to what input the public is able to speak on. Has there been any or, or presented? Go ahead, that? Bob. Uh, there's one coming up, sir. But to date, there has been nothing. Am I correct in that? No, there's no. I, I don't think you're correct in that because even the application for 200 Main Street for the Wellness Center on uh, there, when the application was put in for the grant funding, that was the civic address that was given at the time that we applied for the grant funding. Of course, it was. And I, I believe the reason for that was because you didn't own any other property. But what you did do is announce that the 400 block Main Street would be the location of the healing center after you purchased 200 Main Street in 2015. So again, has there been any public input offered? No. Uh, has the district called for a public referendum and vote on a project well over the $5 million boundaries? I don't believe so. Uh, I do believe that that is mandatory. No, it's that's a good point. Um, if it's grant funded, uh, we, it's all about how it's being paid for. So we really only are required to have a referendum if it's financed or more than five years. I'll jump ahead a little bit on. I'll skip a few things. That's mm -hmm. that based on that. I heard tonight Daryl speak on a culvert, fifty thousand dollar culvert that has come with one hundred fifty thousand dollars. We're talking about a building. Proposed building of 15,000 square feet to be built as a regional healing center in a small town with under 3,000 people permanent occupation of this town. I'm not talking tax I'm talking 3,000 people or so that live here full time. How is that sustainable? It can't be sustainable. Who's going to pay for the overrunning construction? We all know. We're talking $150,000 now for culvert. A year ago was 50. When you applied for the grant, you applied for, I believe it was 5.6 or, or whatever that you received from federal and provincial funding. This 15,000 square foot building is going to cost you 20 million. Where's the money coming from? How's that been presented to the public? Will the taxpayers pay? Will the splat team be contributing? I was told no by the previous town manager. I was told, or we were told, like, like saying I, but like to shoot breakfast, I can say we were told that the taxpayers of Sycamus will carry this on their shoulders. Steve, we, we haven't uh, we haven't seen the final budget, so you're a little uh, ahead of the, of the car. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask this. Is it logical to say that the $5.6 million that, were funded, that was funded to the POS 
build this 15,000 square foot building will not be sufficient. Logical. Well, it's logical. I mean, anything's logical. Thank you very much. Anything's logical. Okay. Um, hey, Steve, where, where are you going with this? I mean, really, I mean, are... I'm speaking for a few groups of people. Okay, okay, just. Has there been community impact studies done? We were told yes. Has there been impact studies done to real estate? Uh, what what will do to uh, neighboring real estate, uh, tourism, business? We were told yes, those studies have been done. So I re I'm requesting an FOI that we have those documents tonight. The so for an FOI, Steve, I need you to send that to me in writing. Okay. okay. Thank but you. I'm speaking it now so you know what's going to come. Okay. And can anyone comment on that? Or has any impact studies been done? We were told by a gentleman who's no longer with us that they had it in this room. Councilor Mollins, you know, um, I said this earlier about people not growing up when decisions get made a year ago or 18 months ago, and then they show up at the last minute because you're the neighboring property. 200 Main Street was uh, Jack Bowers. And when he built the buildings that you're in, that you know, you might obstruct the view, that was a building that was two stories high that had uh, the district office proposed it and the library that was all going to be there. So you wouldn't have a view or a park. And when we purchased that property, maybe somebody said, well, it could be a park or it could be this. It could be a pink elephant too, if you would like it to be. But it's still so town center commercial. It's never changed. It's not a park. It's never been designated a park. There was nobody ever came here and asked as a park. It's like Main Street Landing. It's not a park, but everybody calls it a park. It's still a roadway. Can you explain this? I mean, we can go around and around on this all you want. I can totally understand what you're saying. Okay? But what I'm saying is that I have in my possession a document, this is news, that the mayor was CC'd on, that the previous town manager, not Mr. Carlin, prior to him, reason the purpose of purchase 200 Main Street. This letter was addressed to the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure in 2015, before 200 Main Street was bought. And it was bought in states in that letter for the purpose of community functions and park like settings. Don't quote me, but my words may be a little bit wrong. You can't you can't argue the fact that that's the US doc, a letter. Okay. I know it's commercial. I know who owned it. I know that it was commonly here called the ghetto. I'm fully aware of that. I've been in this town since 1972. That's not the point. It doesn't, it's not about a view or anything. It's about retaining green space and opposition to any sort of development of 200 Main Street. We have no land left. So moving forward, my next question is why <laughs> have we not, we groups and the public not been offered as requested on more than one occasion a proper formal town hall meeting on this subject. You mean the one that's that the one that you're interrupting people at? See that one that didn't happen? Okay, I'm not here to banter and be insulted, sir. Please check yourself. We please, we've had please check yourself, sir. We've had public consultation. We on did this. not have a formal town hall meeting. We I should educate you on. You're not aware of it. I thought we were. That's when you have a word insulting people. I'm not. Maybe you're not aware. I'm not insulting you. Well, you, you said you're telling me I need educated. I'm not going to have this Just the mayor. You have the gallop. He's dealing with it. You also have how many minutes? Normally, this other gentleman spoke much longer than I did. I, I'm a taxpayer also. I will be heard. So I'll carry on with your. I'm trying to with your up. present. Carry on with your presentation. Okay, so yeah, and why have we not been, or why has a proper formal town hall meeting not been set up and offered to the public assistance? It's been done. It's been done. Pardon me. November the 3rd, done. 2021, two town, two town halls were held regarding the Shishu Appealing Center. No, so there is a list. There's, can I just finish? Maybe you need I finish? Thank you. Um, there's a list here of um, communications that were uh, shared. And 
in 2018, um, the, let me just see, the letters of support received from the community for the construction of the Shushwap Healing Center that signed the grant application in 2018, a community wellness study committee was established and conducted public consultation on community wellness initiatives. So the first one was in 2018, Steve, primarily evolved around the creation of the Live More, Live Well strategy. Mm -hmm. um, also the need for health and wellness center in uh, so for the need of health and the welfare center, wellness center. In July of 2020, the district announced that 5.9 million had been received for the province uh, at a public event and shared preliminary concepts of the center. Um, in April 2021, an EOI was issued for the design and construction of the Shushwap Healing Center, uh, awarded to uh, Scott Builders and considered at the September 8, um, 2021 open meeting at council. There's been several um, council and communications uh, with the community on this project. So if there's been a list, this, this council since we got the grant for the wellness center has been talking about it just about every council meeting. So if you're not if you're not aware or you're not informed, I'm I'm not sure whose whose fault that is. I, I'm aware. Okay. I'm, I'm very aware. What you had in September last year was not a town hall. Not <clears throat> none of those functions have been a town hall. It's, I'm sorry. Okay. Here, here, going back to 2018, Steve, we've been. Is when people are allowed to speak. Was the town hall? I believe when you were at the senior center, you were allowed to speak, right? I was told I couldn't. I insisted that I went. Mr. Carlin said I couldn't. Uh, I think I, I was there and I thought. The council was supposed to be the town hall meeting at a head table with a podium like this and an auditorium full of people. That is a proper town hall meeting on any subject. No. And the public is. Uh, okay, we're still waiting. Anyways. We're still waiting for you to get to your point. <laughs> I think Bob had it is. We are in opposition and we do not feel that the district is in the council is operating ethically with regards to information to the public. Okay, that's okay. your point. So, future funding, as I touched on earlier, where and who? Taxpayers, I would assume. Grant money, I understand your uh, council is applying for more grant money. Where will money come? As mentioned, Kelly is on the, has mentioned this to you that there is a budget and we don't. There is a budget. Yeah, and I'm more than happy to send yeah. you the budget and the funding sources for those budgets. Mm -hmm. 100%. Thank you. That's awesome. So I have here an internal document from the district. And there's a few things in it. And it's, I don't know, maybe clarification or whatever, but under park consideration, park consideration, this isn't me right now. It says no budget is allowed. Or to build the park enhancement within the current healing center budget, and it goes on and on and on. Unless additional funding is secured by the DOS for the park, we expect this will not will be a phase. In other words, there's no money in the budget to enhance the park if we build the healing center. Is that why I read that? Can you read that? I mean, I'm not sure what document you're referring to, but I do have um, the park piece or like the green space piece mm -hmm. in the budget funded. From a community grants fund, which is a is an annual uh, grant that we receive. So, we if this bill project continues and goes through, even though it may cost well in excess of the five point six or or whatever that was probably budgeted for. Uh, I mean, I don't have it for talk for twenty eighteen because this is twenty twenty two. I mean, we need to talk in the present. We can't talk in the past. So, if we can find the money. I'm not against development. I'm gonna get I'm against development at 200 feet. As I'll speak personally as a person, I disagree. Tonight I'm speaking for a large group of people to do this. So I understand the geotech and stuff I've read that tonight. That's gonna to go on uh, this week. What is the future or near future, I guess, uh, schedule? Do you have a construction schedule? I have been hearing that a lot of things haven't been mapped, whatever. The 
grant funding applications, dates, so on and so forth. We're asking the project manager to uh, give uh, council and the community an update. We reached out to the project manager in the project, and hopefully they'll come to a future council meeting in the near future. That'll be not in camera, it'll be public to attend or by Zoom, and he'll give a construction update at that time. So when does council feel like construction is going to commence? We don't even have the budget yet. No. So why then? <laughs> If you don't have the budget, it's one of the things that why are geotechs and archaeological stuff being done? Does that cost us money, taxpayers' money, or does that come out of grant funding, or where does that come from? It, it's an eligible Those are partners. Uh, yeah, it's an eligible expense uh, for the grant. And we do have a preliminary budget based on our preliminary design. It's, it's just going into a class D C estimate so we right. can get it all um, fine tuned in there. In terms of construction, mm -hmm. optimistically, probably. Um, not till spring 2023 would we the right now just some uh geotech and arc work is going to be done and then it'll be winter and tentatively in the spring the geotechnical report helps the designer and the architect in their detail mm -hmm. no, no, I I'm asking about the yeah well i thought you is it like the only reason I said that is because the geotechnical report will help the detail design and the detail design helps in the budget. Well, that's pretty much it for today. And uh, rest assured that group of people are in opposition. We will be moving forward with, I don't know what the right word is, other things. I have tried again to ask for proper town hall meeting. Not, I'm going to say the words. If I can be insulted, I'm going to insult you. I don't want to see another dog and pony show information. I would like to see a proper town hall meeting in regards to this. Councilor Malmison, Councilor Anderson, and Councilor Bushel, they still have some questions, so we'll let them. We'll let them. Uh, actually, I don't. Wait. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. You know, when when there's something like this, uh, there's one here uh, was. For Darlene Green, I actually met with Darlene Green today. I talk about Darlene Green. You know who Darlene Green is? She's oh, I know who Darlene is. Okay, so <laughs> she already was talking about the 200 Main Street and a bunch of other stuff. So mm -hmm. he answered most of the questions that you're asking in the document that we sent to her. Excuse me, I'm not done. For the record, how she had not part of Hang on, Steve, please. So it doesn't okay. Matter. No, let right. Councillor Mullis make his point, then you'll have the opportunity to speak. Go ahead. I would prefer you don't come in here again. I would prefer that you actually put it together in writing and submit it, and then it can get answered properly without this uh, bullshit debate thing that's going on right now. Sorry. No, you're not. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to answer no. Councillor Anderson. I'm just going to back this train up because you're very concerned about the now. This project has been being worked on since 2018, 2017, when we we bought that property. Um, I'm not sure who, where the letter came from uh, as to why the district purchased that property, but some of us were sitting on council when we purchased <clears throat> that property. The reason for the purchase of that property was uh, the MOTI came to the district and was presenting a plan of putting where Main Street Landing is, the highway, extending the highway over. So at that point in time, we thought that it would be prudent for us to purchase that piece of property as an investment for Sycamus to have some landing space and, and Sycamus have some revenue off of that. So that's why that piece of property was um, uh, purchased. It has never been in the years that I've been sitting on council uh, uh, de designated or going to be a park. It has always been, what are we gonna do with that piece of property? Should we build a big funky um, commercial building on there and you know have uh, a commercial property or give it to a commercial developer? But then we decided when we purchased, and I just, this is really, really important. The district of Sycamus was going to lose their clinic. Dr. Beach was moving. So we decided to buy Finlayson Place. We decided to buy Finlayson Place. 
and get into the medical business because the healthcare industry, because government was downloading all that onto, communis onto municipalities. So we purchased it. We purchased it and we started growing it and working it. And, and Kelly and Karen Eastland and our healthcare unit, our healthcare building is growing. Our docs are growing out of that center. So we, we knew purchasing 200 Main that it could potentially be our next facility. And the, uh, getting the grant funding with the splat scene, because this community health care center, which is for the area, it's which it is, it's a it's a model that's been used in other communities. So the community health care center is not just for Sycamus, it's for Malakal, it's for Swansea, it's for Enderby, it's for folks in Salmon Arm, it's for Splat Scene, it's for everyone that wants to come here. The um, healthcare center being purchased and for that, uh, or sorry, being moved to that location is able to leave half an acre there for green space. So we still have green space and park with our healthcare center there, which is a common piece of property, which is a, a, a brilliant piece of property actually for a healthcare center. So Steve, I guess my question to you after all of that rambling is, what is it that you don't like about the healthcare center going yes, on that location? It's not about the healthcare center. I support a healthcare center. First of all, I, Council Anderson, I am in complete agreement that this town needs a new medical facility. I completely agree with that. What this is about is development at 200 Main Street. I'd like to correct you on a couple of things. That 200 Main Street property was bought in 2015. And again, some of the comments about the presentation of the Mohegan and so on and so forth is very correct. That's what you said. But the letter from the District of Sycamore states in that document that it was bought for the purpose of public gatherings and park like functions. Since that date, it has been used for that. There were restrooms bought, stages bought, the car show used to be held there. Now we held it over at Philly. No shade or nothing, but people were unhappy. And yeah, you know, this brigade, the beer is for five dollars a year. Um, what can I say? Everything, nothing is happening in 200 million. Why is that? We have a flood in Beach Park. Why are you moving everything over the ball lines? Why don't you use the land that you purchased the taxpayers' dollars in 2015 for the purpose of public gatherings for the purpose that you purchased? That's a direct question. I have the letter. All right. Thanks, Colleen. Councillor Bushell, you are next. Excuse the chair. Steve, your group, uh, your group has a strata. How many how many are in your strata? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Yeah, it's a small strata. Okay. And how many, how many is there in your other group? Four hundred. Four hundred? All part, yeah. Four hundred. Okay. Yep. Good to know. I believe that they all are they all taxpayers, are they all owners? I've got a in the group. I, I cannot, it's a public group, right? I can't. But it, it shouldn't be about if it's all taxpayers. Is everybody in this room a taxpayer in segments? Probably not. And Probably I do not. I do want to say also that as a community of our size, mm -hmm. that we have like I think it's it's a phenomenal amount of green space for this community size. And uh, it, compared compared to any other community. Uh, downtown. Well that was the whole gist of the <clears throat> it's the 200 Main Street. Downtown being gone, and for a regional healing center, I'd rather see a strip mall. Right? Honestly, God, I really would. Rather than than, but it's for me personally. It's not about the youth center. It's about any development. Okay, Steve, just hang on. Councillor McCabe, you are next. Well, you're standing there saying, "Let's let's not talk in the past. Let's talk in the present." But you're standing there talking in the past about uh, I'm not. why we bought the property and now what it's been used for. Well, well that's in the past. past your, your, your and, and you've gone to other public meetings, I call public meetings, and stated that you're concerned about your property being devalued because- I've never you, said that. Yes, you did. No, I've never no, said no. it before. Hmm? I have asked direct questions to the impact on real estate values at the regional healing center in Delta. That's what I've asked. It's not about to me, I take that as concern about property, property values. Everybody needs stories. I'm not worried about that. So that's not. 
shut that off. Well, so events is not a big question. Values. Will we be getting a formal proper town hall meeting? Is council going to do that and put it to the public of this town? All right. Your points well taken, Councillor Evans. Thank you, through the chair. I would say, Steve, but now that you've asked us that, we'll go back to you. Okay. Uh, do you have my contact info? It's actually on the letter of opposition that I presented to the mayor and passed out, which was not responded to, like I said earlier. And please re forward that and we will respond. Uh, you guys have it. I don't need to. Okay. You can do it. Well, Hey. If it, what do I need to do? If, if I can't find, can I reach out to you and get a copy, Steve? Okay. I mean, I can pretty well map where it went. Okay. I can well map. I will we'll touch base. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We're going to move on with. I, I would just like one more comment. All right. I didn't come here to be insulted and ridiculed. Okay. And I find it in very, very poor case of an elected official in this town. That you, Mr. McCabe, consult me to read it. So I'm going to ask you not to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Staff report 2022 property tax update, zoning bylaw enforcement, Monashi Music Festival. Account. There's a recommendation of the district yep, okay. was we're on, we're on this one. <laughs> property tax update. Let's get a report. I've got a really quick okay, we'll get, tax update. Just let's okay. back up. Sorry. I'm asking. Okay. 2022 property tax update. Kelly, you've got an update on this? Yes, I will be very, very brief. Uh, this is just to give council a little high-level overview of, of our property tax collection. Um, uh, the due date was July 4th. In 2022, we collected uh, eight point, or we billed $8.6 million worth of taxes, of which 3.5 was for other government agencies. We don't keep that piece. And at the end of, uh, by July 4th, we had 900, uh, 700, just under 800 standing, which is a better collection than last year. And we had about 25 uh, properties that were have delinquent taxes. So if these aren't paid by uh, September, they will go to tax sale. Oh, uh, and so one little interesting statistic was the number of homeowners that uh, claim grants. I know it's not a big increase, but it is from 872 to 948, like it's a 2% increase in people who live here year round versus their investment property or somewhere else. So I thought that was an interesting little um, interesting little nugget. Um, our credit card payments, uh, we started in uh, 2019. This is how many people have paid uh, credit cards. As you can tell, it is growing. So for the six months, we're at 33. Property taxes, 24. Actually, last year, there was more people who paid property taxes. But these were mainly the last week. <laughs> um, and other notes for um, online bank payments. So uh, 1,099 of the 2,700 uh, folios um, paid theirs through their online banking. So that's an increase of almost 100 uh, from last year, just how people paid. And another couple little things is we collected $4 million in the last week. So thank you to the ladies who were very busy collecting that um, and finance cash receiving everything. And another little um, interesting nugget this year was the um, Arts Council. Um, came in, and I don't know if you guys happened to be here the last week, the Arts Council was in here, and because of flooding issues where they were, and they had um, a bunch of, of stuff out, and it was really, really successful. The amount of people that came through, the amount of donations that they received, I thought it was amazing, and I think we should look at doing something like that almost every year. With that, uh, I'm done. Yeah, I, I was here for them. I was fantastic to set up, and what they did for the Ukrainian family was amazing, yeah. Right, and they got a lot of, you know, action here. And we even had popcorn for anybody who came. <laughs> That's it. Comments or questions for Kelly? All right, here are none, we'll move on. Okay, now we get into the next one. Zoning, zoning bylaw enforcement, Monashi Music Festival weekend. Okay. 
There's a recommendation that District of Sycamus Council resolve to a temporarily suspend enforcement of zoning bylaw number 101-1993 between July 21st and 24th, 2022 for camping on private property within the district in support of the 2022 Monash Music Festival. Let's get a mover on this and a seconder, Councillor Malmus, seconded by Councillor Bushell and Jason, give us a report. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to do my best to represent this. Um, the the actual the actual recommendation for doing things this way came from Scott before he left on vacation. So, but we did discuss it. So, I'm going to do my best to represent re represent this. Um, I think everybody is aware of the difficulties the monastery has had finding places for people to camp and go whatever else through the L ALR and through other uh, regions and things or whatever else. We're kind of faced with a situation at the end here where we anticipate that people are going to be coming to this event are going to probably do what they can to park in various places. We already know the private res residents are being set up for people to park in the, um, those lands and various things happening can be happening uh, uh, around the time. So um, Scott recommended at this point that that he felt that the best way to deal with this is just to temporarily um, suspend the enforcement of the bylaw when it comes to specifically camping on private property, not uh, in anything else. We'll still be enforcing all our, par our parking areas, making sure that the streets re remain safe to, to to be on things or else this is specific to if somebody has you know more, more cam campers on their on their private property than they should for this particular weekend that will we'll basically ignore that that for this particular situation um and also it had to do with the timelines of people getting in to, uh, because because monetary festival found out about these changes so late in the process is now that people didn't have time to change and things and actually submit through the proper process to get to, to be able to get these permits to get these exceptions and what whatnot that this is where we're going so again it's it's very specifically just for camping on private property and does not affect the other areas of the bylaw we'll still be report enforcing everything else as it always would would exist all right thanks jason comments or questions on this councillor malmas uh, in the report they have options option one's an option two so uh, option one is the actual recommendation. Option two is to maintain the current zoning plan. So, Councilman, sorry, could I just get some clarification? And maybe I'm just I'm a little shook up right now because <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> um, so, where does where do people if we're Temporarily suspending enforcement of people camping within the district. Where do they normally camp? Like, where would, where do they camp? I, I, you know, I'm going to have to defer to others that have maybe been around for other seasons. I haven't actually seen it first. Second part of my question here is if people are camping in on other people's property and they have permission, why do we even care? Like I, 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 I'm kind of confused by this. I guess maybe somebody can give me some clarification. I, I think what this really relates to is more of the the land on Finlayson that is being used for camping. Okay. It's an alternative. Councilor Bush, go ahead. I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but I think they've reached out to everybody. Like. Jim and Val Wood right across the road. They, they have out to everybody for camping. They have. Camping's going on right now over there. It's going on on Man Road. It's going on. It's going on everywhere. Uh, we just, I think you're just trying to do it legally. But trying to do it formally. And 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 Kelly is correct. It it, it does have to do with the, the, the part partly has to do with the the removal of the fifty or the fifty or so campsites that he'd already sold. Fenderson Street as well in that process and, and making sure that they don't get fined for the temporary temporary use there because that was coming forward. Uh, Go ahead, Councillor Anderson. Okay, so backing this train up, um, Monashi Music Festival. This is basically for this event. Correct. Uh, wasn't um, weren't they not allowed to? camp on the other side of the road was that not something to do with the liquor license that they couldn't it was it was the alr it, it had to do with the alr rules is as long as there is an event happening on AL, alr property which is our dog park you cannot use any other alr property within the district for any parking or camping 
So it basically almost eliminated what 90% of our property. <laughs> that that is really that's I, I'm, I'm making up a number. I don't mean to be facetious, but it, it eliminated almost every other opportunity other than private land uh, to to stay on because it all falls in that same category. Councillor McCabe, go ahead. I, th I think I would rather have staff just turn a blind eye to this as opposed to legally sanctioning it. I'd rather I'd rather not sanction it. I would just, you know, enforcement by complaint. Um, if there's no complaints, uh, turn a blind eye to it um, for two days or three days, whatever it is. Um, some people come early, stay late, whatever. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather just staff deal with this instead of asking it to come to council. Um, I, I, I'd, ra I'd rather not vote on legitimizing something that shouldn't be used for that purpose, especially without a business license, because it's not just camping on private property. Some of those private property owners are going to ask for payment for use of that private mm -hmm. property. That's true. So mm -hmm. then where does the business license come in? And, and you know, I'd rather just not even yeah, vote on this. Me too. Uh, this is interesting yeah. when you're talking about the temporary use permit. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to add, so the flip side of that is if council doesn't make a formal decision to not enforce its bylaw, it's precedent setting, setting for future. It's like, well, you didn't enforce your bylaw then, you turned a blind eye. And staff are turning a blind eye. Why are you turning a blind eye? Why aren't you turning a blind eye to me? Well, this amendment, this is to amend the bylaw. If no, we, it's not to amend the bylaw. It's just to, there's case law to support a temporary temporary suspension of enforcement of a bylaw for a very specific purpose. And it's recommended that you actually make that formal decision rather than not, because if you don't and staff turn a blind eye and don't enforce upon it, it's just if setting up a case, well, you're not enforcing your bylaw on this matter. Why are you enforcing your bylaw on this? Right, it's... So we're putting a corner. It's, it's put in the corner. It's yep. patch 22 or whatever it is. So temporary suspend. Um, For very specific. And we tried to be specific in the wording of this, yes. that it's camping on private property. It's not just anywhere. It allows people to put, I guess, as many tents as they can reasonably fit on their property for the for those dates alone. Just to the Monashi Music Festival. Can you can potentially charge people for doing that. Well, they did. They probably. Councilor Bushill had a comment. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, if we turn a blind eye, then then uh, it can happen. You know, they can come back to us on another event. If 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 we don't if we don't do it, then and if somebody complains, we have to act. It makes sense to just for the weekend. Councilor Malmas, Councilor Aries. So. When he went on his website and decided that he had camping, that I don't know, $50, $65, some of it $165 a night. So he is charging. And he actually thought he was going to get some land someplace. I don't know whether he had a discussion with Greg Darrell, but I had a discussion with Greg Darrell, and Greg Darrell was going to give him the other piece of the property that he had. He just said he had to go in there, but it's dry camping, right? Which is right across the road now. I don't know whether they did the logistics on it or they thought it wasn't enough space and they needed more space. So Jen's absolutely right. If you don't do this, then you're just saying, hey, don't worry about it because nobody's going to do that. But that sets a precedence in the opposite direction we want to go. Thanks, speak there, Tim. Councilor you were next. Uh, to the chair. Um, let me speak to if a property owner with a big piece of property uh, quite a few people on their property didn't have any facilities for you know didn't have water supply didn't have toilets like what kind of liability do we have somebody has 40 campers in their field and they find somewhere to do things they leave a mess yeah they, they leave a mess they can't shower they, there's just bushes around it how does this uh i i'm really open to this I just want to make sure we have our bases covered Councilor Evans. I was just going to ask a question, sir. Um, when Stomp was in the dog park, am I right in thinking people were camping there? Correct. Okay. There was camping. And and so with the Monitor Music Festival, the organizer doesn't think that he's allowed to have people camp there or has things changed since then? 
to the chair, I can, I can answer part part of that. that part of it was is the type of camping. The tent camping for the stomps is just tents and whatnot, whatever else, which for whatever reason doesn't follow the same guidelines as if you're bringing in camping units and and, and self sustained units. That's that's the that's the difference be, uh, between those two of them. Um, and also Monashi also in terms of their setup doesn't have the space doesn't have the space in there because of, well, at least with the original plan with the, the with the food vendors and the things where else where stomp is much more of a free for all. It's kind of an open grounds with just a little bit being taken up by a beer garden, basically with the stages. Okay. Call for McCabe. So I understand the explanation about the president if we don't, but what about the president if we do? Now, every special event from here forward is going to say, well, you did it for Monarchy. What's the difference? Why can't you do it for me and me and me and me? We've never done it in the past. I, I, why are we at a point? Sure, Monarchy got caught off guard with the Agricultural Land Commission, but we've, we've never, uh, from my recollection, never done a, a temporary uh, what is temp it's a suspend enforcement. Yeah. Temporary suspend enforcement in the past for this. And yet we've had lots of events in the past. And if we do approve this, then every event in the future is going to say you did it for them. Uh, why not us? Yeah. It's still a cup here. It's got to come back here. So. So. All right. Well, we do have this temporary suspension enforcement on the zoning bylaw. And uh, we have a mover on it and we have a seconder on it and we can bounce this thing around all we want, but I'm gonna call the question on it. And then you guys can make a decision on it whether we're gonna go forward with it or not. So this is the deal. I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor of the resolution. Okay. All those. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, boss. <laughs> All those opposed? Three. So this is okay. Whatever you say, boss. <laughs> I think that staff is recommending this. I'm going to have to support this. So I'm going to vote in favor of it. I'm not so sure, though, but I, I mean, I'm going to vote in favor. Of it. So we're going to, it's going to, so it's uh, carried. All right. Where's the easy button? I don't know. Easy button. It was tough for me because I'm not so sure because I, I tend to agree with what you had to say as well. I agree too. But we supported this event. Yeah. And now we're going to the event. We're going to try to so. the event to go for. I'm not upset okay. that it anyway, it's carried. Velvet variance permit application 22159 DVP. This is on 206 Martin Street. Okay, I think before I read out this re uh, this resolution, Sarah, give us a report on this, please. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to let you know that the applicant, Mike Gavel, is available on Zoom this evening. This property is located at 206 Martin Street, just off of Riverside Avenue. You can see from the photo here uh, that there's a garage in the back and that back when this ortho was taken in 2018, there was a double wide mobile home on this property originally. Uh, so this property is designated within the residential medium density land use designation. It's zoned R1 and 2, single and two family residential, and it permits a single family residential dwelling. The proposal here is to construct uh, a new residential dwelling unit, and there is an existing detached garage in the rear yard. The mobile home that was there is no longer there. Uh, and the current owner is a new owner of the property. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you could see <laughs> all of my slide. I can't on my screen. Uh, so we've got the front of the house here, and I just wanna point out, because I don't have this image on the other slides, the eave, there's a projecting eave, but this is what this is all about. 
And it's this one <coughs> along the front here. Where I'm live and in person, where you can't see online. So the applicant is requesting a variance specifically for this eve. I've got an image of the side profile so you can see just how much it is projecting from the face of the building. Uh, and then the site plan here, which shows the existing garage at the back and that eve again where it's projecting. And so it's projecting into the front uh, yard setback, which is six meters. I think everybody's familiar with that. And they're asking for 4.79 meters. So the important thing here is that the foundation of the building meets that setback. It's just the eve that's projecting into there. Uh, and it is a larger projection than what our bylaw exempts. So that this is why the variance. So we've got a few photos of the site. You can see the existing garage back there where the garage doors in that are. And uh, looks like there's been some site prep done in preparation. So we did receive a building from an application for this first and that's how the variance request was identified. Over to you. All right. Comments or questions before I read the resolution? Councilor Malmas. Councilor Bushel next. Uh, through the chair, this came to the Planning and Development Committee, and it was explained that after they looked at it, they thought about it that the way the front of the house is, that the windows of that, the access for a structure, sure, I don't think he has the deck out there, but the uh, it was more to keep the sun out of the front end of the house. That's what it's about. So, and it'll actually make the house look better. So we approved it. Okay. Councilor Bushel. Yeah, through the chair, um, uh, Mr. Gavel is mm -hmm. taking an uh, older uh, residential home and uh, and uh, freed up a trailer for somebody to purchase. It was a park model on the property and uh, is really looking forward to cleaning it up. And uh, I mean, he's only asking for a little bit of a variance and it, it will really cosmetically make the building, the home look really uh, comforting and uh, appealing from the street view. So we supported it 100%. All right. The recommendation that the district of Sikkim is authorized and issue the development variance permit number 22159 DVP for lot two, district lot 452, Kamloops Division, Yale District Plan 20329, to vary the district of Sikkim zoning bylaw number 101 1993 Setbacks for the single family dwelling front setbacks from 6.0 meters to 4.79 meters for a single family dwelling. I need a mover on this. Councillor Evans, second by Councillor McCabe. Any more comments or questions on this? Hearing none, call a question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. All right. Development permit number 22065DP and development variance permit number. 2065 DVP addendum file, and that's uh, at uh, 1118 Riverside Avenue. Sarah, can you give us a rundown on this as well, and then we'll read out the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just a reminder of this particular proposal. So this came before council uh, late May, earlier this year. Uh, the noted development permit and development variance permit was issued. It was for this marina at 1118 Riverside Avenue to be uh, upgraded in support of their license renewal with the province. Uh, so those permits were issued with the original proposal, which was for 82 births. Um, but when it went back to the province to complete their process with the Section 11 and the license renewal, the staff there identified two berths uh, that were in fact usable. Uh, I don't think I put the plan in here, sorry. Um, so it actually ups the number of berths to 54. So our zoning bylaw doesn't regulate the number of, of berths attached to marina. So it's not an issue with our zoning bylaw. Uh, the, the issue with the, the, that we went, you know, when we described the proposal in the permit, 
it was 52 births. So those permits are specifically for 52. The province does not have a problem with issuing their approvals for 54. Um, they do in fact allow up to 10% more than the number of strata units to accommodate any guests. So there isn't an issue either way. So what we're putting forward is to approve by resolution an addenda to those permits that would recognize the fact that there's like a minor calculation difference in the number of births. All right, any comments or questions on this, Councillor Malmus? So was that an error on staff's part about the 52 or their application to us? Did they have 52 in there that they reviewed it and thought, or did we assume there was 52 as cool. opposed to what? Right. So um, when we process these, like it's a water course development permit, more specifically for yeah. environmental. So we're specifically relying on the QEP report. Um, and that was 52. Uh, so because the marina needs to go further out from the upland property to prevent it from grounding, it does put the marina in an advantageous place where they actually can access births that you normally potentially wouldn't count. So because they're accessible, they'll be used. The province doesn't have an issue with recognizing that. So this isn't the exact plan because the, the, the fingers are the docks are longer. Um, this is this one and, and this one that will be usable. So they're sort of an out, they're sort of outside births. Um, so Keith is available online if, if anyone has questions for him. It was the QE's issue or his issue? Replied with it. All right. Any other comments or questions? I'll read the uh, resolution. Uh, just a second. Sarah, did you say that there's a revised resolution? My apologies. That is what on my agenda is, is missing a couple words. So if I may, may I read it out? Okay, go ahead. And that the district of second moves authorize and issue an addenda to development permit number 22065 dp development variance permit number 22065 dvp for the property legally described as foreshore lease number 339995 adjacent to the upland property legally described as strata plan kas2841 located at 118 sorry 1118 riverside avenue to reconcile a discrepancy in the calculation of births in the proposed arena okay i need a mover Councillor Aries, Councillor Anderson, any other comments or questions on this? Okay, I'll call a question. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right, moving on. Uh, August 10th, 2022, meeting of council recommendation that the August 10th, 2022, regular meeting of council be canceled. Okay, moved by Councilor McCabe, second by Councilor Aries. Any comments or questions on this? Why? <laughs> Why? We're just moving it. There it is. We need a vacation. A holiday. A vacation. Okay. I think that maybe we could use a break. We usually council, we usually cancel one council meeting in August. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but there's a lot going on, so I'm just kind of wondering if we're not. Okay, any other comments or questions on this? Okay, I'll call a question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. <laughs> Definitely unanimously. It's a holiday. It's going to take a holiday. District Act, asset naming policy number PW. That in recommendation that council adopt the district asset naming policy number PW18 as presented the 13th day of July, replacing street naming policy PW18. I need a mover on this and I'll get Jason to comment. Councillor Malmas, seconded by Councillor Aries. Jason, give us your reasoning. <laughs> Thank you to the chair. So uh, this this was was started as we know we had a couple of, of, of individuals looking to to do some naming uh, within the district and staff identified and recommended to, to council um, that we develop a, a policy um, for, for naming that would take not just streets into consideration but other assets as well parks trails um, any any basically uh, amenity of the city that we can that we can. Uh, 
uh, potentially name for someone else. So uh, we, we went away and uh, looked at various different uh, municipalities to look at what they're, they're doing right now. Most have some sort of naming policy or whatnot and that, that fit very closely to the type of policy you, that you, you see pre presented to you today. Um, of course, any one of, especially the, the, the time differentials or the type of uh, where, where we uh, would put a time on the council, um, count, count, number, number of council seating that someone has to sit or the number of years before someone passes, whatever else, those are all adjustable, of course. These are recommendations that come out of what the general, uh, the, the, the general average from what other policies were, as far as that goes. Um, in addition, at the same time, uh, I, sh I should say this does not, the, the, this does not go for corporate naming. Uh, corporate naming and corporate sponsorship of, of facilities would be a completely different uh, di different policy that should be looked at independently. If council wants to do that, it doesn't really fit within the guidelines of this policy. Um, the other other bit that council asked us to look at is the the individuals, uh, Mr. Lloyd Gavel and Mr. Rob Flockhart. Um, there are already um, processes that were started to look at identifying locations for them. Um, we have begun that process, and we've identified. Uh, locations for each one of them that, that, um, that I think we have. Sarah, can we pull those those pictures up? I'm sure which one you bring up first, but let's wait and see which one comes up first. Uh, for Mr. Gavel, um, we've uh, identified uh, a part of, of, of the Greenway um, trail system that would make that 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 we're looking at proposing to put out to the public. Um, we'll, we'll do a 30 day public consultation process that we plan to put out this Friday, but I wanted to give it to council tonight to be able to give any, any comments before we do that. But we're basically we're looking at that trail process and that, and that section of trail specifically that we would uh, name for Mr. Gavel uh, at this point in time is, is what we're putting out to the public. And in Mr. Flockhart's um, um, situation, it's uh, coming up right now. There we go, it's, it's a... Yeah. Beach property that comes off that comes a uh, road there, whatever else, and basically looking at naming that Flockhart Beach area. Those are, those are the two recommendations that staff are bringing forward to put to the public. Um, of course, council can make other recommendations to put forward here, and even at the end of the 30 days, it, we're just going to give you the public input. Council can choose to, to go whatever direction they want there. So the, the policy is there for the future, and then we're going to try to follow the process for these two that are already in, in process, and we'll start in that quick. All right, Councilor Malmus. You bring that picture back up again. So the people that are looking at doing what they're doing there, they're, they're going to put in a DP to put in, what is it, 12 or 13,000 for, the, for the, where the park is? Yes. And so their first request to do that is going to be to take that park and move it in front of the other piece of property, which has parking. The other piece of property being the where the hotel was proposed where the concrete is. Okay. So that was their ask. And we had a discussion instead of had to come back to help, mm -hmm. but I had a conversation with uh, Evan. And basically, we don't have any parking. That's, that's the problem with that yellow banana there. Is there's no parking. Where if they gave us 10 or 15 stalls within the parking lot of that other development Absolutely. dedicated to the be at the park, be it in front. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Sure. If they come in for their DP, that park, I would support them moving it over there with 10 or 15 parking spots, definitely. Because sure. so, uh, sorry, through the chair. So if we identified sort of that that tip as being an, uh, the, sort of the area that we're looking at to name, name a beach park without identifying that specific piece, would that be all right under the circumstance? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Right, right. okay. All right, Councilor Cave. I, I think go ahead with what you're doing, and the name could follow it if it changes location. Fair enough. If if it does, yeah, I support this. Uh, good, Councilor Moms. Well, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to create a road in there, so you have the possibility to call it road blocker way or whatever. Right. So. There is that opportunity as well to yeah. actually develop it because the road's coming in about where there's no trailer that open spot from the, my memory's correct on the way to access ones. I think I think the the, the thought process of, of those of us that were looking at it this way is that blockers were known best for the hockey, the recreation side, but whatever else in the beach kind of area was an, an appropriate 
and a venue for, for that type of individual, not that a street wouldn't be as far as that goes, but if it's available that we'd look that way. But yeah, I mean, we, and we, we can generalize it out a little bit when we put it in there to just identify that area that we'll be naming something in that area, so. All right, good. All right, any other comments or questions on this? Okay, I'm gonna call a question, all those, go ahead. Jay. Before I do that, I just wanna make sure it's not just the block card and gavel, it's actually the policy there too, if there's any questions on the actual written policy, because you'll be, Adopting a full <clears throat> policy to forward, forward. So I know we're, we, I know that we had those two specific examples. I just want to make sure there's no questions on the actual policy as, as well, because we kind of flew through that part. <laughs> there's a, a whole back, background there. So if, if everybody's happy with that, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. Does that go back to that? <laughs> now, the recommendation we, we had a mover and a seconder on this? We did. Okay. It's, re, it's regarding the policy. So, um, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay, water regulation, rental, and connection charge amending bylaw number 1023 2022. There's a recommendation that water regulations, rental, and connection charges amending bylaw number 1023 2022 be given first, second, and third reading this 13th day of July. Councillor Evans, Councillor Anderson. Uh, Daryl, you want to give us a bit of a report on this? And we'll... Sure, through the, through the chair. Uh, last year, we had a pretty exceptional summer with the heat and the smoke and the warmth and the fire conditions. Uh, in all the time I've been here, I've, I've never seen us struggle to make water. Now, I know there's there's comments out in the community that, you know, we got a big lake, we'll never run out of water. It's, it's more about... Um, a lot of people hitting it at the same time. So uh, we go into every spring and when May 15th comes, we have an automatic uh, water conservation schedule for people. They're supposed to be watering even houses on even days, odd houses on odd days. I know we have lots of latitude with four hours in the morning, they can do it, four hours in the afternoon or in the evening, they can do it. We're basically giving them eight hours of watering on on given days, which which is is fine. I, it's just and that's worked forever. Last year scared us a little bit, so I guess you know on my to do list was to create a mechanism going forward where if we have really tough conditions arise, that you know through this through my office we can make a decision to to ratchet up the water restrictions if we needed as needed so that works both ways because like i said we go into may and it's automatic and it goes right to september uh, i guess the changes that i'm proposing would just afford us the latitude to crank them up or, or back off them if we're having early wet september do we really care about the watering it's if it's not a problem we'll just have a little more control over it so this is really stemming from the hot and dry and just not being able to, to pump as much as we need to. Uh, there's been a lot of considerations given on how we would do this. How do you ratchet it up, you know, without restricting the hours each day? And then knowing that if you restrict hours to like an hour for a certain segment, they're all gonna hit at that hour. And then that doesn't solve our problem. We're still getting those huge peaks. So what I'm proposing is, is based on some different models that I've looked at from different communities. Uh, and we're, we're basically, you've got the table up there, Jen. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're, we're basically looking at uh, staging it. So instead of just one size fits all, we have stage one, which is you know, very typical to, to what we've been running year after year. And this would kick, up, kick on at the same time period. So in May, we're looking at even number, uh, numbered houses on even numbered days. The only change is we're not restricting them to those four hours and four hours, so they can spread it out through the day. Obviously, they pay a bill, so they're going to want to have their water go as far as it can. They'll probably wait until it's cooler at night, earlier in the morning. I just don't want to drive them to like you know a prescriptive time where we're all seeing a huge influx, uh, and this stems from. A few really, really hot days last year with the fires. People had sprinklers going on their houses. I get it. We had other people that were way away from the danger zone and they had sprinklers going on their driveways. 
and we had you know a lot of use going on. Uh, we actually watched you know our pumps working over time. And we can trend that and look at it in a second and actually see three pumps going uh, to, to drive water up to the reservoir. The, the water treatment plant at full capacity with all three trains running and the reservoir level actually rolling over where we're losing ground with everything going full blast. So, uh, you know, it's about it's about pulling it out of the lake and you guys know this. So we pump it to the, to the water treatment plant. The filtering process, we're, we're limited. It's the bottleneck. We have all those filters, those trains. We get about uh, 32 liters per train. We can tag those on but that they're maxed and that's, so when your peak is more than that, you watch the trend roll over on, on the reservoir. It's not a good feeling. And it happened for a couple hours at a really busy time on a really hot day, uh, but it happened twice. So I just put it on my to-do list. I'd like to just have a mechanism where we can ratchet it up. So level one is even days uh, and the even houses, odd days, odd houses. If we ratchet this up to say a stage two, which again, if we get the message out of stage two, now you're gonna start getting people's attention. So I, I kind of like the idea of labeling these as level two, stage two. Um, and so we're leaving the days wide open. All we're doing is we're moving it to a Monday, Thursday or a Tuesday, Friday. And they've got all day to water. We're not like, we're not gonna tie people uh, you know, so the, they're losing, they're losing their grass or their gardens or, or any of that stuff. So uh, we have a provision in this as well that they can grab a hose and manually water whatever they want to any day. So we just don't want sprinklers running out of control. So uh, that would be stage two. Stage three is probably something we would have considered last year when we were just pounding through the water, not able to make it quick enough. We would be looking at something like imposing this for a short time if we had to. Again, it's even number uh, houses on the Mondays and Thursdays. So that's consistent. That message will get out on level two or three and the odd numbers on Tuesdays and Fridays. And so we're just saying now it must be handheld. Now you, you've got to use your hose. So you walk over to your garden. You can stand on your grass and do it if you want to. But we really don't think people are going to be holding a hose for hours. It's going to really curtail what gets sprinkled out there. Uh, there's a few other little changes. We had a residential component, a non-residential, and an industrial. It's been kind of merged together. We're calling the industrial and the non-residential the same. So that's a little bit simplified. Um, yeah, that, it just there's a little bit of language in what I'm proposing that just says that we can make the change with 24 hours notice and send the messaging out. So just, just a tool that uh, allows us to have a little better control when things are crazy. Moms. Well, that seems like it was spent a lot of time on and it's looked fairly good at the surface, but People that have an irrigation system could set that irrigation system so that it only waters for 50 minutes. And I've watched guys stand out there with a the hose, and if you're not going to regulate the hose, then the guy's going to use more water than an irrigation system is. I think that maybe you might want to look at this and go, okay, rather than being able to water all day, because if somebody's at inept at saving their grass and you got out well you got a garden hose so they're going to stand out there all day and water the whole lot because they want to save their yard you got to realize most of your population senior citizens have got nothing else to do with their days <laughs> so if you impose that when it's hot out you either water from five in the morning until seven in the morning or from seven at night till nine o'clock at night rather than all day, because all day is going to consume a lot of water as well. You have to restrict the amount of time that they can be used in. And maybe it is a, a tight window. Maybe that's a little, it's five in the morning till seven in the morning. Like my sprinkler system set on to come on from nine till 10 o'clock at night. And it only runs 10 minutes. So it's, <clears throat> I use less water to do that and it's only every third day, it's not easy. 
Uh, and I, my lawn was green last year when it was 45 degrees outside. So, and I did not try to overwash at all. So, the idea that you could water all day with a garden hose, I don't I think you're going to find that that's going to be just as much water use as, as the other way. Sorry. By just by calling. Okay. Just wondering about whether or not the uh, groundwater from the river just below your self watering. <laughs> got to pay. <laughs> <laughs> for water with us. But I get it. Okay, Gerald, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, through the chair, point taken. Uh, I think um, we're, we're not ever, or I don't see for CS being in a position where we're going to need to knock the water use back to nothing. I mean, if there's a fire, and I guess I should have, I failed to mention this, we have a level four in here as well. It's just one line, and it's basically you don't use any water outdoors for any purpose except health and safety reasons so if we need to crank that rate down we will and and it's just a nice thing to have in there if we need it um, in terms of you know watering on a sprinkler for 10 minutes per zone three times a week yeah so if you were in level two or level three all we're asking is you adjust that to align with your civic address and, and you can still do that on a on a monday and a thursday or a tuesday and a friday Yeah. Sir, I know this isn't really appropriate, but as a chair of communities and women, obviously, this is a policy that's important to those sorts of things. I, I get to uh, Jeff's point, but to me, it's really about getting the message out and being having that communication tool so that people are knowing that, yeah, it's changed. And it seems good to do that in that way. All right, Gordon. Yeah, thank you, Chair Daryl. <clears throat> yeah, I like what you put together there. And you know, Jeff's got a lot of good points too. Um, but you, you got to educate the public and then uh, something to be able to rely on and something to eat. So, yeah, no, I think hey, you got to protect your infrastructure. Here. Brian? Uh, well, I think uh, can be, it's it's hard to control people. Well, the ministry has to because you, you can only generalize for the whole population in so many ways. Now, I, I, I think this is about as simple as it can get to have an effective plan. All right. I support it. Yeah, thanks. You get a mover in a second. I don't have it written down, so I'm going to say no. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think that was a recommendation. That we nation that water regulation rental and connection charge amending bylaw number 1023-2022 be given first, second, and third reading this 13th day of July. I need a mover. Councillor Evans, Councillor Aries. Any other comments on this? Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, it it says water regulation, rental connected charge amending. So you you're not changing any of those things, are you? That, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. That was it. All right. I'm gonna call a question. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Daryl. Correspondence for action, together we are strong for discussion. Together we are strong sponsorship letter. Councilor Anderson, did you want to comment on this? No. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> okay, then we'll move on to the next group of correspondence. Is there any of the correspondence here? We have correspondence in regards to interior health standards, mayors for peace, city of New Westminster, Gail Christopher, interior health, three different letters regarding interior health. Any comments? Uh, okay, Councillor McCabe and then Councillor Bushel. I think uh, Gail. Gail hmm? Go ahead. Go ahead. I think Gail Christopher's uh, Indigenous Days uh, that's redacted. I think that would require a response from council, mayor and mayor and council. We could ask staff on our behalf to draft something. Yeah, I, I read this and you know, we can respond to this. I, I would sit down with uh, Jennifer and we can have a comment. Go ahead, Court. Yeah, I kind of was taken back by this, and uh, I had talked to Jason and Jamie about it today, and they've already reached out to Gail. 
I know Gail as well. And uh, yeah, you know, after I mean, just going to the beach park today and listening to Slats and talk about how we support them and and uh, you know all that, you know, it was I'm just kind of taken back. And I will talk to Gail about it, but for sure, if you if the district wants to send a reply and and Jason and uh, and, and that, I'd be fine with that too. I think when I read this letter, I I was a bit concerned about it as well. But I think we need to give this letter. A, I think we have to answer this letter and we have to answer it and give them an update of the relationship that we do have with Spalatz and we do a lot with them. Councilor Anderson, your comments. Uh, just, a, just a comment to Jason and Jamie. Did we not have something going on that day? It, uh, myself and Jamie were yes. there. We represented the district and and <laughs> it's one of those funny things that actually Jamie actually said hi to Gail on the way by and I don't know that she didn't recognize that we were representing the district or didn't recognize who who was <laughs> saying hi. So to say that she didn't see anybody there was a little odd, whatever else. And that's why Jamie wrote back. And I, I was going to say that too, is I can pass that on through council. As Jamie did respond on behalf of the recreation department. It's actually very well we an email and, and it listed all the things that we've been doing as a record duration department, well, not from a council perspective, but a, as from a staff perspective, what we've been doing. So, I mean, that can be taken into consideration on your response if you want to write back to them that what we've already sent back um, as well. And, and when we felt that was reasonable because we were actually in attendance and Gail and Jamie have a personal relationship as well. But it seems like she has a personal relationship with several people. So I, I can share that with all council. I did share with Dr. Bushel earlier it was today or yesterday that you asked for it, and I, I, I said that to you. Well, obviously, the person needs to be informed. Um, Councillor Malmas and Councillor to the chair. Maybe you should read the letter. I recall the chamber commenting. She says that the district is sick of us. I recall the chamber commenting that, boy, we really blew that because it came up too soon. Next year, we'll have something. So that's it to us, but she's on the chain. So I recognize that we, we have a pretty good relationship, but after today, all the meetings that we have with, with Splatseed, uh, I'm, I'm missing this because it's directed at the chamber. Well, it's attention all count. Councillors and district staff, that's what it took. Councillor McKay, you had a comment? Well, yeah, kind of two district to sick and move. So if the rec department's already responded, I, that's probably good enough then. Yeah, possibly. Okay. Councillor Evans. Thanks. It's just a question. Um, what is the date so that I can put it in my phone for next year to give us notice? It's June 21st. It's the 21st. Thank you. Culture Aries. Yeah, I, I know the citizen as well. And I know she's got really just got good intentions with this. I just wanted to get it into the I respect that she submitted it here because she just wants people to see it and be aware of it. And she just cares. Okay. Well taken. Anyone else on this? Any other correspondence that counselors would like to discuss? And I'm hearing none, so. We will move on. Nation that the regular council meeting for July 13, 2022 be adjourned at uh, 824. Officer Malmas and Sir Anderson, all in favor? Thank you. Oh, that was a good. <laughs> Lots of nuggets in there. <laughs> and every story. Good.